Boa tarde. Agradeço imensamente a presença de todos. Para nós é um prazer muito grande. Eu vou começar a falar umas poucas palavras de boas-vindas em português, primeiro, para explicar o contexto do que, que a gente está fazendo aqui. O seminário será transmitido em inglês, né, sem tradução. É, mas eu vou ter umas, é, uma pequena introdução em português para que todo mundo possa acompanhar. Esse evento está tá sendo transmitido online. Então, a gente tem as pessoas assistindo né, é, online. E essas pessoas podem enviar perguntas para a gente no e-mail uh, iearesponde.usp.br. Então, quem quiser pode enviar perguntas para a gente, a gente vai ter uma discussão um, e podem enviar. Peço para as pessoas que estão aqui presentes, um, po podem fazer perguntas. Como ele está sendo gravado, só vou pedir para perguntarem bem próximo ao microfone, né, para que isso possa ser gravado. E tanto o vídeo como as fotos do seminário, elas vão estar disponíveis na mediateca do IEA eh, ou no canal do YouTube dentro de cinco dias úteis. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for coming here. I'm just uh, having some note, notes and warnings for the people that is watching uh, online. And I want to give some few words in Portuguese before you start. Would you mind? Okay. So I'll do it. Um, muito bem, então, esse, esse, esse seminário de hoje, ele em português se chama Futuro das Sociedades Dependentes do Mar, Mudanças Climáticas e Comunidades Pesqueiras. Em que contexto que esse seminário ele está? Ele está incluído, digamos assim, né, na programação do, um, dos seminários que foram propostos no projeto Futuro das Sociedades Dependentes do Mar, Mudanças Climáticas desigualdades e cooperação em sistemas socioecológicos complexos, que foi um projeto que eu é, liderei aqui no IEA. E um, essa, esse, essa apresentação de hoje vai ter dois convidados uh, super especiais que foram meus parceiros num uh, programa internacional, num projeto internacional chamado GALS, essa sigla que vocês veem ali significa Global Understanding and Learning for Local Solutions. Uh, é um, foi um projeto financiado pelo Belmont Forum FAPESP. No, aqui no Brasil, quem financiou foi a FAPESP. E uh, esse projeto foi feito nesses países que estão assinalados em amarelo, no, no mapa né, do, do logo do projeto. E algumas perguntinhas breves antes que a gente comece. Né? O projeto GOLS, ele foi, ele ocorreu no Brasil? Sim, né? esse projeto ocorreu, ele tem esse nome em português, financiado pela FAPESP. O que, que a gente estudou, primeiramente assim, em português, rapidamente, a gente estudou um pouquinho a percepção, a né? percepção de mudanças em parâmetros do clima, Fizemos alguns estudos de vulnerabilidade social, vulnerabilidade às mudanças climáticas. Fizemos alguns estudos de caso com alguns recursos pesqueiros que estão sofrendo algumas alterações e algumas comparações também. Por exemplo, com, no caso do Bonito Listrado, nós fizemos comparações Brasil, África do Sul e Ilhas Maldivas. Fizemos alguns estudos de sensitividade ecológica, Usamos projeções de modelos climáticos e oceânicos e tentamos fazer um rescalamento né, para as regiões é, é, costeiras brasileiras nossas. E, principalmente, é, como o projeto era muito complexo em termos dos países participantes, das pessoas de diferentes culturas, diferentes contextos socioeconômicos que participaram, nós passamos bastante tempo desenvolvendo metodologias comuns. Né? Algum método que a gente pudesse é, utilizar, tanto aqui no Brasil, mas também, por exemplo, na Índia, em Madagascar, nas Ilhas Salomon, na Austrália. Isso levou assim, muito tempo para a gente propor uma, algumas metodologias comuns né, alguns é, é, modelos conceituais comuns que permitissem a gente, num futuro, comparar 
né, esses ambientes, esse tipo de comunidades e o tipo de também impactos e ações de mitigação e é, de adaptação em cada local. Então, muito, muito desse tempo, se, uh, nos dedicamos a, a essa metodologia, essas metodologias comuns e, ao mesmo tempo, cada país, dentro do seu país, propôs abordagens diferentes uh, com a sua forma de, de também enxergar né, as questões uh, socioculturais então, em, cada, em cada contexto. Também fizemos, tivemos participação, não no projeto Gauss, mas especialmente nas pesquisas que a gente propôs e desenvolveu, num, uh, num evento organizado pelas Nações Unidas, chamado um, Fish Adapt, onde vocês têm aí no, na tela um documento, onde ali foram publicados vários casos de estudo sobre mudanças climáticas em comunidades pesqueiras de vários países. E também tivemos um projeto de educação, tá? com material que está sendo finalizado agora nos próximos meses. Tivemos é, workshops sobre educação, né? mudanças climáticas e oceanos. E tivemos alguns projetos que derivaram deste, vários projetos associados. Bom, então, como eu disse, o oceano global, estamos todos conectados. Né? O oceano é um ambiente que nos conecta a todos nós. Como a gente cobre contextos diferentes, né, contextos socioculturais, contextos econômicos, é um desafio. E é por isso que hoje eu tenho muito prazer de convidar, né, de, de ter aqui nesse, é, é, nesse evento, a oportunidade de ouvirmos duas perspectivas bastante diferentes. Tá? Então, a gente vai ter aqui só... É, para mencionar alguns dos artigos né, que saíram em relação às metodologias comuns, e as diferentes. Temos uma infinidade de publicações locais, onde cada país teve as suas abordagens. É, para nós é um prazer termos duas perspectivas aqui bastante diferentes. Tá? Vamos ter uma perspectiva é, mais da ecologia humana e uma perspectiva a mais de políticas de adaptação, mitigação, impactos, no caso do estudo de casos da Índia. E agora, então, eu vou passar para o inglês para a gente realmente começar né, o, nosso, o nosso seminário. So, I was explaining the context of this project that was uh, essentially, it started in, in this project called Future of Marine Dependent Societies, Climate Change, Inequalities and Cooperation, in complex socio-ecological systems, which was led here at the Institute of Advanced Studies. And I was saying that we are all connected, we have this kind of interconnectedness, in our uh, global ocean connects us, and during this uh, period here in this project, we could uh, participate in a series of publications and uh, outcomes, like this special issue on uh, small scale fisheries, that I participated during my stay here, this fish adapt uh, conference that was um, organized uh, by FAO. Um, and our perspective here in Brazil base, uh, was mainly based on, on some previous work that we, we've been done on climate change and fishing communities. And the Belmont Forum was a really nice opportunity to connect with these different uh, hotspots. <coughs> We have four seminars uh, scheduled to be presented in this context. So, so today is the second one, uh, that is the, the one that you are uh, here today. And we're going to have two more in, in the next few months. So today, uh, the most important question I would like to, to pose to our panelists, that we have really distinguished panelists here today, but would be why in-depth studies really matter 
why we need in-depth studies at the local level, at the regional level. And also it's good to have this global analysis and comparisons, but why it's important to have in-depth studies, not surface studies, but more in-depth studies. And I don't mean that we are talking about oceans, so this is a deep <laughs> question, but we are talking about really the, 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 the essential uh, issues in, in each of the of our countries. Well, here in Brazil we have a couple of, of case studies. I won't uh, delay too much, but just for introducing to the, to the audience because we're going to have different contexts, but just for uh, figure out, uh, here in Brazil we have we conducted some studies at the, in the South Brazil Bight area and also in some other areas, but this uh, work was mainly uh, done by uh, Ivan Martins, who was a PhD student at the Oceanographic Institute of the University of Sao Paulo. He couldn't come in today, unfortunately, because uh, we were supposing him to talk uh, a little bit of this work, but it was a PhD thesis, and there are a lot of uh, papers um, on, on his work. But the, our contexts were focused on fisheries-dependent communities, mostly small-scale fisheries, engagement with grad, grad roots, and also looking at the South Brazil bite as part of a warming marine hotspot. So this is, this is Ivan Martins. And also, I want just to show this, uh, this slide here, when the vulnerability index in the X is plotted against the per capita carbon emissions of the nations, right? And you can see that the nations that are most vulnerable to uh, climate change um, are the, the ones that has less per carbon uh, emissions. So we can see that the nations that are not vulnerable are the ones that impact the most. So just to, to have some context on that. And also that climate, vulner climate uh, um, variability really have strong impact in the economy. Yeah, so for instance, in South Brazil, in the years of El Nino, El Nino Southern Oscillation, this is mostly climate variability, not really climatic changes, but climate variability can impact, for instance, losses for people that um, fish on shrimps, for instance. And it was estimated about of, uh, $5 million um, dollars per year, per each year that in the season you have the El Nino, for instance. And we have a lot of impacts, for instance, in ocean warming. So the, warm, the ocean is warming, and we have uh, impacts in the natural system and also in the social system. We have some sea level rises that impact the, the settlement on some coastal communities in those areas. We have rainfall, floods, um, heat waves, things, this kind of signals. Right? We have storms and hurricanes also sometimes affecting seriously those communities and also the fisheries that they uh, do in the ocean and also some problems with ocean acidification, right? Um, also uh, in terms of ocean circulation because the currents are changing and the velocity of some currents are really changing in, in our uh, global ocean and also this climate variability and the, um, uh, the frequency of um, extreme events, yeah, we can say. Uh, so here, this, these were the main uh, perceptions uh, from the community, and here in Brazil we focused more in the ethno-oceanographic um, framework, in, in this part of uh, study, how we study the perceptions of those communities, yeah. And this is very important for the fisheries and aquaculture sector because we need to address the risks, we need to build adaptive capacity or try to discuss how we can increase the adaptive capacity of ourselves and, and those uh, kind of uh, interest in fishing communities. And this is very important for plans for the sector that sometimes are not covered by governmental agencies, especially in cases here in Latin America. This is a graph showing the increase of, of ocean uh, surface temperature, which is really documented. 
And this is a graph showing the areas that were considered hotspots of ocean warming, right? The areas of the world ocean that ha are, are having uh, um, rates of uh, warming significant, right? And here, the southern part of Brazil is one of these hotspots. And we also have a case study in Australia, also in India, Madagascar and the Mozambique Channel. We were studying, we have colleagues in South Africa and here in Brazil. So this is the Baldman Forum project uh, we were talking about. And we, in terms of vulnerability, we are also comparing different marine areas and different socioeconomic uh, uh, sectors. It's a huge international team, led by um, a colleague from South Africa. Uh, and here in Brazil, we also have the contribution of many students that collaborated with us. Also, uh, some professors from other um, departments here at the university. Uh, from different uh, areas of knowledge. Uh, so I'll uh, skip this. Uh, the working groups that we organized in this project are mainly uh, working groups on ocean models, so try to downscale and think what's happening uh, in, in the ocean models. Also risk assessments. We are covering social aspects and uh, education, policy and institutional mapping and overall integration of all of these. So it's a complex uh, project, right? With lots of people and with several uh, working groups. And these ocean models represented some interesting idea for us because it guided us in the projections of change, what it is supposed to change. And if you want to uh, go into much detail of this, you can just watch in our video of the last seminar on climate change and oceans, then you can realize uh, something on these kind of changes. But we have stressors, and in each different area, we expect more changes than in other areas. We also have this social vulnerability analysis, species sensitivity. I need to go very quickly on that, just to, to, to the people have an idea of the, the type of work that the project had. Uh, system models, policy institutional mapping. And here in Brazil, we also had some uh, ideas on uh, increasing the, the understanding on the perceptions. Okay. Okay. So today, we're going to see different perspectives. This is why it's very, very interesting and we are honored to, to have you here. Because sometimes we look at social vulnerability and how we study social vulnerability to climate change can differ a while, right? Uh, we can have this kind of perception analysis and we, we have field works in fossil fishers communities. For instance, here in Brazil, we have lots of perceptions studies. Uh, to see how people perceive the, the changes that they face. This was the method that we used here in Brazil, but I can tell you that uh, we can see different ways of, of studying these kind of things. This is, these are just examples on what we studied here in, in Brazil in terms of sea level changes. So comparing different communities and how different communities perceive this kind of change and how science can explain, support these perceptions or not. Maybe the perceptions were just a starting point to raise hypotheses that can be tested scientifically. So the interaction of traditional knowledge or Fisher's knowledge with science were really uh, explored and has been uh, explored. Okay, so some examples here. I cannot, I'm not a panelist, so I'm just uh, giving this introduction. And if you are interested on, on these Brazilian studies, please uh, send us an email and um, we can discuss uh, later on, on this kind of data. But we have lots of, of interesting outcomes. And all, the, all these studies were done in 
C2, right? At the communities levels, uh, talking with people, talking to fishermen and collecting real data. The social vulnerability framework, I will uh, let uh, my colleagues uh, talking about this. Uh, just to mention that we use this kind of vulnerability framework and we have uh, uh, this method paper was led by Dr. Aswani that is uh, here today. And we are looking at sensitivity, adaptive capacity, and exposure indicators. So we're collecting data, analyzing indicators, and having this kind of results. So this is lots of conceptual approaches. This is some of the communities that we tested the, the method. Just some pictures for you to, uh, to see the reality of our communities here in Brazil. And that's all. So, today we will have, we have invited one anthropologist and one economist. Why? Because we want to see different perspectives on this kind of issue in different contexts and different frameworks. So we're gonna have one first presentation uh, that uh, Dr. Shankar Naswani will cover some coastal human ecology works and it will be our interest in, in his very interesting talk will be the theoretical background that we really uh, need to understand humans ecology of coastal people right and secondly Dr. Shyam Salim from India he will be talking more uh, policy oriented issues and we're going to learn how impacts mitigation and adaptation um, studies are being conducted in India, right? So first of all, um, Dr. Shankar Naswani. Uh, Shankar, thank you very much for being here. Um, Dr. Shankar Naswani is an anthropologist um, who holds a bachelor degree in marine affairs, but also in anthropology from University of Miami. He got a master's degree and after a PhD in anthropology for, uh, from University of Hawaii. He is currently a professor at the Rhodes University's Department of Ichthyology and Fisheries Science in South Africa, but also uh, he has a, 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 a professor position in the Department of Anthropology there. And he has been conducting research on a wide variety of topics involving common property resources, indigenous environmental knowledge, cultural and human ecology, economic anthropology, political ecology, and marine conservation. He has experience in Solomon Islands, so this is in Oceania, and in Africa. A lot of uh, works. And recently, he has been studying changes in coastal communities caused by climate change. So I think we can uh, first invite uh, Shankar to talk and, uh, and thank you very much. Well, hello everyone and go good afternoon and thank you for welcome welcoming us here at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, I'm going to speak in English today, but uh, I will say something in my own native language. Uh, si alguno tiene un problema en entender lo que digo, yo soy de España, ¿vale? Y soy de Barcelona y hablo catalán, de hecho. Si alguno de vosotros no entiende lo que digo en inglés, porque me imagino que siempre hay gente que no tiene fluidez con el inglés, me imagino que es más fácil que si lo digo en español, pues se puede entender más, ¿no? Intentaré hablar por tiñol si es necesario, ¿no? Y creo que de ahí se puede entender algo. Pero voy a dar la charla en inglés, ¿vale? Uh, and I, you know, I, w I was one of the leads in the vulnerability analysis in the Gulls. Uh, but I've actually chosen today not to speak about that at all. And, and uh, Maria was telling me why, you know, this is Gulls. And I said, yes, it's Gulls. But a lot of the work we do in these vulnerability analysis, they almost come to these aggregate indices where a lot of the data is aggregate to look at, you know, these different patterns across the regions in the world, and that is fine when you're doing global perspectives, regional perspectives, or even national perspectives. But when, to, when, you, when you really want to focus into communities, 
you need another set of tools and perceptual uh, methods and theories to actually understand what's going on on the ground. Because often, you know, you have these large global meta-analysis, but if the local data which a meta-analysis is based on, or the case studies that they use, is not accurate or good, then, you, then you are, you're living in a, in a pie in the sky, right? So I really want to talk about, you know, often my colleagues said, but no, you have to look at the big picture. You have to look at the big picture. Well, you know, we are living in, in a cataclysmic world now, where we are having the collapse of our major ecosystems and we are having tremendous problems. So I think that it's important to scale down back to, to uh, what Mary was saying about the community. And when I saw the title of the talk, I, she said coastal dependent communities. I thought we have to talk about communities. So I, I've switched my, my talk a little bit. So I'm actually going to talk about different kinds of things you can do, because often you know, when we think about human ecology. In fact, here in Brazil, you have a tradition of human ecology. People like Alpina and other people have been working in human ecology for years, certain areas. Uh, uh, but with the social ecological systems paradigm that's actually today, you know, overruling a lot of the environmental science literature, it seems that a lot of these traditions have been forgotten. And then you have in the humanities very strong postmodern, post-structuralist, you know, critical theory thinking, you know, all those kinds of things. And it seems somehow that the, the, the air for doing human science, okay, is being sucked out of the room of most humanities departments. So I thought it would be interesting to talk about maybe some perspectives that were very common in the 1960s and 70s, up to the 80s and 90s, but today maybe are not as common anymore, or maybe they are, maybe I don't know about enough about Brazil, but uh, my understanding of the global literature is that there's less and less of this. So let me talk about coastal human ecology and what I mean by coastal human ecology here. Uh, so I want to talk about it also in the context of goals because, because uh, a lot of the work I've done independently in different projects that I've worked in, uh, have also been kind of brought into goals. So the, the, there's a relevance here in the terms of goals. And, and when I talk about people's perceptions and behavior vis-a-vis -vis climate change, we, I'll bring examples from Madagascar and the Solomon Islands that have been used in the context of goals. So my talk is goals and non-goals, kind of, you know, like in and out, okay? So, you know, what is uh, coastal human ecology? You know, we look at how p humans adapt biologically, cognitively, culturally, Okay, and transform ecologically, politically, socially, coastal ecosystems, okay, and marine environments. So the, the scale, uh, it, it's a different scale. You look at individuals, actor base, you look at communities, uh, and usually through long-term field work, okay. Um, so we also study how humans interact closely with ecological communities, okay, while simultaneously studying how those interactions themselves kick back and influence society themselves, okay? Humans are also ecological organisms that interact with the ecosystem. And while we possess culture, which is a proximate mechanism of adaptation that we use to, uh, to deal with the world, we are also constrained by these, uh, uh, you know, these interactions with the environment, and, and probably more so in, in the near future. Anyway, so in just very, very general ways, what, what a coastal human ecology would do is try to understand proximate and ultimate causation mechanisms uh, in, in the behavior of humans vis-a-vis -vis coastal environments. So when I mean proximate, you know, you could, you could read their culture, perceptions, and so forth, what we, what we conceptualize as our reality as living organisms. But you can also use of behavioral science and human behavioral ecology, evolutionary ecology, to understand uh, underlying mechanisms that actually thrust certain types of human behavior, okay? So for example, you could use optimal foraging theory to look at human movement across the seascapes, all the kinds of bioeconomic models to understand patch choice and time allocation and so forth, okay? Uh, and these are common traditions in human ecology. So let us uh, just quickly look at this, and just quickly, I'm just going to talk about Che, uh, che, che Boludo, <laughs> you know, Che or Coastal Human Ecology vis-a-vis CES, -vis which is socio-ecological systems. And I, and I want to talk about this because 
today, the Folky and you know the the, Estoc the people in, in in Sweden working on on resilience and vulnerability, they've basically sucked the air out of ecological human studies. Everything is framed within a socio-ecological systems framework, which is fine. And, and I think Che, or in this sense, human ecology fits quite well, and I'll show it later. So these are not antagonistic approach, approaches. And Che itself is not a discipline any, in any way. It's actually what I'm going to talk about, which I am calling coastal human ecology, is a collage of different approaches that come from human geography, environmental sociology, environmental science, uh, and ecological anthropology, and so forth and which extracts methods from, uh, again, ecological anthropology, human geography, uh, you know, marine science, zoology, climate science, and so forth. So this is sort of like a, a hybrid, and actually it's important, because uh, if you remember E.O. Wilson's book in 1998, he talked about consilience, right? Consilience between humanities and sciences. And actually, that is the only way to go if we're going to address a lot of the problems we have in our living planet. So sectarian thinking doesn't work anymore. And we need to kind of move beyond our sectarian academic boundaries to address very serious problems, okay? Wicked problems in marine and terrestrial conservation today. So let's, let's and this is why the reason I thought talking a little bit about coastal human ecology as an approach was kind of a way to think about bridging humanities and sciences. Uh, so. For example, you know, just to make a little bit of difference in these two, uh, the field of focus, you know, CHE tends to be local, and this is where Mary was talking about, uh, the lo local-centric view, looking at local processes. And again, even though GULS was a global project, we actually did use a number of case studies across many different countries. And I was working in terms of GULS in Madagascar, Solomon Islands, South Africa, and, and, and a little bit in Mozambique, but that part is not there. And now we are doing Tanzania too. So we do all these local centric studies, and I want to talk about them a little bit. And usually a, a socio-ecological systems framework is more regional to global. Uh, field term is usually uh, long term in a hu coastal human ecology context. Uh, if you look at a lot of the work that's been in socio-ecological systems, you have a student, they go into a village, they parachute in and out, they do some perceptual data, uh, you know, so they run some surveys on people's perceptions about things and so forth. A lot of the work we do in coastal human ecology does that too, but also does a lot of work on behavioral information. So record how people actually behave through observation, focal follows, time allocation studies, income expenditure analysis, and a number of different methods that are used to do so. Okay? Units of analysis tend to be actor-based, although not necessarily all, all the time, in, in, uh, in a CHE context where in a CES you are looking at systems. That's why we talk about coupled natural and social systems. Theoretical scope, uh, often but not always, is neo-Darwinian in a CHE context, and I said not always. Whereas in a CES you have a resilience and vulnerability. And that's the thing I was supposed to be talking about today, but I'm not going to talk about it today. Okay? Uh, but anyway, and methodology, again, I said observational behavioral data versus perceptual data. And Mary today was talking about perceptual data, and I think that's important, but there has to be more. And I'll tell you quickly another story. You know, I spent out of my 27 year career, 28 year career, six or seven years physically in the field across many countries in the world, and I spend a lot of time with local people. And often I do these perceptual surveys. And when I do behavioral studies around time allocation or focal follows, often what they say is not what they do. So, right? So if you're collecting perceptual data and the perceptual data doesn't match with their actual behavior, we have a serious problem in, in the kind of data we are collecting in terms of human behavior, okay? Uh, so, Again, there's no shortcut here. You can't just go one week and get your data. You have to spend a lot of time in these places. So it's very field intense, and this is why there's a lot of people not wanting to do this, because it takes a lot of time and, and effort to be in a community for years, as a matter of fact, or many communities, as a matter of fact. And in terms of the ancestry, you could link a, a CHE approach to something like cultural ecology or, and, you know, uh, says to systems thinking and ecosystems approach in, in, in ecology and, and other social sciences. Uh, so just, just to give you some background, uh, what are some of the topics you can actually study here? Uh, uh, and there's a lot of topics you can actually look at. 
and I'm just going to quickly uh, across a lot of them, and I've written about probably in most of these different subtopics that I'm going to talk about, and then I will jump to actual examples of what you can do to illustrate once you focus down at the local level the kinds of studies you can do because often you know I speak with a lot of my, my colleagues in, in the, in the, so in the um, natural sciences because I, I actually work in an ichthyology department and, and their, their perception of what social science is is very limited. They think that you just go talk to people a couple of weeks and that's the end of the story and then you understand the human dimension. Well it's not that simple okay. Uh, so let's just look at, at some topics that we can think of, and many of these have crisscrossed with our goals project. So, you know, m history matters, okay? So you can look at maritime interactions across space and time, and within that framework, uh, you can do maritime archaeology and coastal adaptations, and of course we could spend hours speaking about any of one of these topics, which I'm not going to do, but I will do illustrate some of these different themes as I go across some of the case studies that I will be uh, presenting. Uh, you can do indigenous navigational systems and trade networks. Uh, you can study historical ecology of uh, fisheries and seascapes. And mind you that all the things that I'm talking about do matter for conservation and resource management. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, I believe in increasingly so, and I've actually written about this lately, about actionable science, doing stuff for societal needs. And in, in my case, I think that it's important to do, you know, human science that's applicable to conservation, resource management, uh, and so forth, okay? So historical ecology, again, uh, an important uh, sub-theme in the maritime interactions across space and time. Um, and I think, didn't you have a picture of, fish, of, of the past of Brazilian fishermen today, one of your slides? Uh, so, of course, they're shifting baselines of people's perceptions of, of catches, but, you know, catches in Brazil, uh, in artisanal fisheries, and all across the world were much higher before than they're today. Uh, anyway, you could do ecological economic behavior in marine environments. Themes here, you can use human behavioral ecology uh, and evolutionary ecology to study marine foraging behavior. Uh, you can do experimental economics uh, in fisheries. In fact, I've done quite a lot of work, of work on, on looking at cooperation and the public good games, using that as a sort of a, a proxy to understand cooperative behavior in fishing communities. You can study social cultural behavior in marine environments, including, of course, ethnographies, ethnographies of fishing communities. This is what anthropologists commonly do. You can study coastal uh, and marine tourism, political ecology of fishing and aquaculture, coastal food security and livelihoods, I'm sorry, and, and food sovereignty, basically also a very important uh, issue today, particularly when we have hundreds of millions of people that still depend on, on, on subsistence or small-scale artisanal fisheries for their livelihoods, and here in Brazil that being a very important factor. You can study the subgroup, marine knowledge and governance systems. And this, of course, was part of what Mary was talking about today, uh, including local knowledge and, uh, and articulating that with, with Western science for resource management purposes, for, instance, for example. Uh, you can work on marine territorial systems and co-management. Of course, marine protected areas and social and ecological impacts. As you see, there's a lot of broad themes here that, that encompass a lot of different things. Okay? But again, these are all as they pertain to coastal communities. And usually small-scale subsistence, even artisanal or small industrial communities that are working in, in, in coastal areas. And of course, the, the paradigm of socio-ecological systems, which is working with uh, marine interactions in complex adaptive systems, and that being the theoretical paradigm in, in, in our work here at GULS, uh, working on marine socio-ecological systems. There's a wide literature on that, and that links to a lot of the work in vulnerability and resilience. 
uh, environmental and climate change and coastal vulnerability. I'll talk a little bit about some case studies on local perceptions of climate change today when I show some of the examples from Solomon Islands and other parts of the world. Proximate and, dis uh, and distal drivers of resource use also. This is a theme within this topic. These are all emerging areas where people are writing quite a bit about. Uh, so it's not that I'm just inventing these things. These things are part of the literature. And I'm synthesizing different trends within uh, a wide literature in coastal marine human interactions to think about um, different things that can actually be studied. Okay. So just, just to quickly show just a little figure, uh, this is a paper I just wrote on, on this subject precisely. Uh, some of the sort of, you know, all of these different themes can or cannot be some of them are closer to not, not to what I would call orthodox or traditional uh, human ecology. You know, those being human behavioral ecology, experimental economics, uh, studies on, on human uh, indigenous knowledge and marine territoriality, being closer to the traditional topics studied in, in, marine eco in coastal marine ecology. Uh, sorry, co coastal human ecology. So just quickly, uh, so just quickly, I'll go through some of the places I've worked on to so give you an idea. Some of them, and I say this because some of these are part of Gulls. I've worked in Solomon Islands, in Hawaii, in the Marquesas, in French Polynesia. I did the work in paleoecology, paleo uh, work on archaeology in Tonga, Palau, Republic of Palau. So you see I've worked quite a bit in Oceania. In Africa, I've worked in South Africa. I've also been part of Gulls, Madagascar being part of Gulls, Tanzania. I'm working in the Canary Islands with a colleague now at La Laguna in Tenerife, and so forth. So anyway, so let me talk about a little bit some of case, sort of kind of case study to kind of reflect on the work that I've, not only I've done, but the work you can do with these kind of subjects and the works that have actually been plugged into our GULS project. Uh, again, uh, Solomon Islands was not part of GULS at the beginning of the project, but when I came as a, as a colleague uh, with the members of the team, South Africa and Brazil and other parts of uh, the world, uh, we began also to look at the Solomon Islands. So we'll talk a little bit about Solomon Islands, quite interesting country in Oceania, uh, in what we call Melanesia, if you know anything about the region. And I'll talk about a little bit about different su subjects I've worked on to give you examples. Um, so done work on uh, ethnohistory and, and maritime governance. Marine tenure, what, we talked, what I talked about, about before on marine territorial systems. And of course, in the, in the context of CHE, of coastal human ecology, you can do many things that can be drawn from different disciplines, such as ethnohistorical research. You can do genealogical demography to look at uh, demographic patterns across space and time. You can do spatial patterns of settlement analysis across time. So we looked at territorial behavior, how people moved across the seascape over the, you know, the last two, three hundred years. That kind of information is very important to understand the mosaic in the, in the case of Solomon Island, Islands where the ocean is owned by people or territorial systems are still functioning where local people claim the ocean as their property. It's important to understand these social dynamics and demographic dynamics to understand how people own this property today. And that's relevant because if you're trying to establish a marine protected area and you don't know what's going on at that, in that space, you're going to fail, basically. Okay? And, and this is not only relevant for Solomon Islands, but it's also relevant uh, for many parts of Oceania in where these kinds of uh, systems where you're working with local communities and working with local chiefs with indigenous territorial systems, indigenous knowledge systems, there is no alternative, okay? And we're talking about vast areas of the, of the South Pacific, which hold tremendous biodiversity. When you talk about Coral Triangle, uh, uh, you know, most of these areas, Papua New Guinea, parts of Indonesia, uh, parts of Philippines, maybe not as much in, as intensively, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, are very strongly ruled by this customary management system. So you need to work with them and you need to understand them, okay? And again, uh, when we talk about coastal vulnerability, you need to kind of understand all these different dimensions that are actually go into it, right? Uh, working on also thinking of these, you know, if you think about ecosystem-based management, these units, 
these local units that people live in in places like Solomons, any one domain of ownership, it's not just the land, but it's also the land, the lagoon, the islands, and the open ocean, all known as a unit of, of uh, ownership. And that's it's interesting because if you know about integrated coastal management or ecosystems-based management, it's actually the integration of different dimensions when we think about management. So in this sense, in places in the Pacific, you already have these systems functioning or had function in the past. And work, you know, I've worked a lot with institutional governance, so trying to get not only what people say, but what people have basically inside their mind, uh, so you can do things that related to cognitive and psychological anthropology, uh, and look at things like cultural consensus analysis and how people understand uh, their tenure rights or their ownership rights to sea space. Uh, you can do studies on conflict and natural resources. As a matter of fact, the continuation of GALS is going to look at that dimension of conflict in small scale uh, um, island nations and, and conflict with resources as they relate to diminishing environments and climate change. Done work on experimental economics, as I mentioned, to understand cooperative behavior. And again, it's important to understand cooperative behavior in people, how people cognize their environment, how people cognize their, their tenure rights. Uh, and anyway, all of that information can plug into a better understanding of the, the, the social reality in terms of uh, tenure systems and governance at any locality. And of course, this kind of work can be done anywhere, in Brazil, in India, anywhere. Done a lot of work on socioeconomic transformation and coping strategies, lots of work on time allocation uh, and income expenditure of, of, the, of communities uh, to see uh, understanding a little bit their livelihoods and what's going on at the local scale. A lot of work on gender. Uh, a lot of my students have done work on gender and looking at differences in, in resource access between men and women. Time allocation studies, uh, meaning you know, you can ask about time. Usually in a survey, you'll go to a local people and ask how many times a week you fish, how many times a week you go to the market. And often when you do time allocation studies, when you actually measure people's behavior through spot checks or direct observation, you get very different results. Uh, and if you do that across spatial temporal variation, you see a lot of annual variation in, the, in people's behavior. So again, these are more quantitative ways of actually measuring people's behavior beyond just perceptual data that you get in a particular survey in a particular moment in time when you go to that community and get that information. Um, again, a lot of work on nutrition and food security. So we've done a lot of, you know, when I say we, I see myself and my students work on uh, nutrition, you know, through food diaries, understanding, coping strategies, and so forth. Again, it's very important to understand the local context because when we talk about resource management and resource dependency, you need to understand these kinds of sort of small-scale patterns to see what's actually going on on the ground. Okay. And again, you know, in, in my case, in Solomon Islands, I used a lot of this information to actually develop a network of marine protected areas. Okay. Uh, so a lot of these sort of local uh, information were plugged into the design of the marine protected areas themselves. Uh, looking at uh, human foraging in this case, uh, that was a work I did many, many years ago, but I use human behavioral ecology to understand spatial mobility of foragers, how they forage across this, the seascape. That actually you can't tell, but that is a geographical information systems a rep spatial representation of foraging patterns across tidal variation in any one year, in one particular year. So we, we've, we've brought all that information from the foraging analysis that actually adds to more than 15,000 hours of artisanal fishing behavior into a geographical information systems to spatial temporally uh, display people's actual foraging behavior, fishing behavior, when I say foraging, okay. And you can do focal follows, that's really hard. You follow fishermen and fisherwomen all day long and actually record their behavior. You can use self-reporting diaries to have people actually report on their actual behavior. You can do creel surveys. Um, again, you can look at, plot a lot of that information into geographical information systems, uh, GIS, to, and uh, as I said, uh, doing this myself, I've recorded about 920 hours of actual observational data and over 14,000 hours of self-reporting data. 
Uh, and that is actually uh, almost a time series because I've done so between 2000, uh, 1992 and 2014 when I stopped collecting some of this information. Lots of data, yes. And, and one of the things, and, and this is something I was discussing with Maria, is that when you have these long-term engagements with communities and, and you collect these micro, fine microeconomic and microecological data, a lot of the stuff people are collecting from perceptual quick and dirty surveys in villages don't correspond one inch with what's happening in reality. So when we look at these new, we have lots of studies and meta-analysis using data sets from many parts of the world, they're using data that is actually unrealistic. Because when you actually scale down, you see that the many things that people are reporting are actually not happening the way they're being reported. So that's something to think about, OK? Because a lot of people tell me, but we don't have time to be a year there, or two years, or three years. We are not anthropologists. We need a quick answer. But if your quick answer is wrong, then what's worth it? What, what is it worth for? There's no shortcut for long-term research, none, unfortunately. Anyway, let me continue. I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll try to wrap up in the next few minutes. Uh, Also, a lot of work on, on human for and women foraging. Actually, I, I gave a talk in, in Maria's class about this, so I'm not going to go much into it. But looking at women's behavior and, and, and exploitation of shells and measuring uh, their harvest patterns and the effects of marine protected areas that were designed around women. Uh, uh, this is just some pictures of the shells, both Anadara Granosa and Polymesoda, that we, me that we monitored for years. Uh, in terms of monitoring some of the MPAs that women created and foraged in, both being closed, temporal, and open sites. Some of my students running quadrats and counting shells, a very difficult, arduous work. And again, just looking at some of the results of the, of the, of the, um, of the studies in monitoring we did, but I'm not going to go through this, but I want to talk about uh, other things that we've done that are of, of importance. Uh, also looking at indigenous ecological knowledge. Uh, again, this is the, uh, what Maria was talking about. And this is not that presuming that indigenous ecological knowledge is sort of supposed to be a conservation strategy or that it actually conserves anything. But when you're working with local communities, that is the ecological reality that you're living in, right? This is not about being romantic about local people's perceptions or imagination. There's an issue of environmental justice. Of course, you want to have local people included in, in, in management. And for that, you need to respect their knowledge systems. And you need to acknowledge the validity of their knowledge systems. And if you can incorporate them into a scientific program, that's even, even better. So we've done a little bit of that over the years. Uh, lots of work on, inter you know, on uh, interviewing and participatory mapping. Again. Uh, ground truthing a lot of this local knowledge with actual marine science through creel surveys and the water visual censuses, interconnectivity studies. So a lot of the, a lot of actual science, so marine science being conducted to actually see correspondence with indigenous predictions or hypotheses about uh, fish behavior, interconnectivity of populations, and different kinds of uh, biological and ecological processes. And for example. Well, that is a benthic representation of indigenous knowledge. So what, what is that? You see that map over there? That, that map is uh, the benthos as represented by local people. So we call this imic knowledge, local knowledge. So you, we've mapped a lot of this using uh, GIS in where we have representations of different uh, abiotic and biotic substrates as understood by local people. And actually, when we've done correspondence and uh, studies to see in terms of what local people are saying that the bottom of the ocean look like, about this are probably about the 60 to 7 percent accuracy. So they, they pretty much know what's going on. And when you look about ha habitat representation in building uh, or designing marine protected areas, you can actually use local knowledge to do that. And, and you can have the indigenous knowledge brought into the participatory uh, process of uh, designation of a park or a marine protected area 
and, and that's when you have uh, true participation uh, in, in these kinds of processes. And I'm not saying that, that they shouldn't do your proper science either, but you can work with these two different dimensions and have them combined. Okay. That is a representation of a, cognition, a cognitive representation of each layer in the GIS. So uh, we've done a lot of different works. I mean, I spent 20 years basically collecting a lot of this, uh, this information. If you look at the layers, you have georeference, then you have the abiotic substrates. So we have indigenous knowledge for, for a whole lagoon ecosystem in Roviana and Bonavona Lagoon that actually show that. So each of those layers or themes in the GIS show different different forms of knowledge that have actually been imported as social data into a, into a GIS database. So there's a biotic substrates, there's locally identified marine habitats, biological events of importance that are recognized by local individuals, uh, floating sites where people actually fish, and corresponding catch per unit effort per sites over periods of time. So a lot of the, 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 the catch data has actually been imported into the GIS. And, and so forth. As you can see, we have uh, lots of human ecological data, okay? And, and that is, for example, the mosaic of, that's if, if, if you can see, that is the, the island of New Georgia, and if you see the Barry Islands, and where you see those all white spots in the middle, which I'll show a, a picture now in a moment, those are local reefs as defined by local people for which we have information. This is a little bit more scaled down picture of the actual georeferenced indigenous patches and habitats as recognized locally. If for each of those, we have all those layers of information. So you can query the GIS about, about basically uh, ask anything in terms of that information and get a, a spatial representation of that, that information. So we talk about under human understanding of the seascape. So when we build cultural landscapes, you know, Landscapes that are not only understood by ecological processes, but understood by people's understanding of that. You can build these very detailed cultural and seascapes about people's interaction with the ocean. And the ocean for people in Solomon Islands is not just places to exploitation, but they have very strong cultural meaning. They have very strong there are areas of navigation. There's all these different dimensions that are important to consider, uh, which we, we have imported into the, the GIS also. Okay. So, for, for example, there is a map of some of the MPAs we design using a lot of that information uh, uh, to specially represent that information locally so people can actually get a sense that their knowledge has been included in the, in the marine protected area designation process. That is their interpretation, correct. But we actually did a lot of ground truthing, uh, as I said before, through with marine science studies to actually look at habitat distribution and species distribution, uh, abundance and size distribution, and so forth. And it, it corresponds quite well with the local understanding of what's going on in the ocean. And just, just a quick, I'm writing a paper now with a friend of mine and looking at the loss of indigenous knowledge, what's happening to local knowledge locally, and, and that's a, a multi-dimensional scaling representation of, of people's understanding or knowledge. So you have the master list, at the bottom there, the little blue triangle. And basically, the, you know, the villages that you see, in, you see the, the triangles and, and the, the, the red triangles and the, square, the green, green squared areas of the people from villages that are further away from markets and are older. If you look at the, yeah, the, the light blue and the, and the diamonds, uh, the, the purple diamonds are usually younger groups which are closer to markets. So basically what we are finding is that there's a, a very strong pronounced transformation of indigenous knowledge and you could actually argue that there's a loss. You know, anthropologists always like to talk about syncretism and you know, all these renovative processes where different knowledge systems have been hybridized and whatever. But the fact is that local people are losing their traditional knowledge uh, uh, as, as fast as 2 or 3% per annum we've calculated for Solomon Islands. And this is also a global phenomenon. Uh, last year, I, I did a sort of a, qualitative, a quantitative analysis of qualitative data. We couldn't do a meta-analysis. Uh, this appeared in PLOS. Uh, and we, the trend, the global trend on local knowledge is that there's a, probably a, about 70% of studies reporting loss. Okay. Uh, so, so this is something to think about because when we talk about vulnerability and resilience, local knowledge is important. 
right? So when, you know, like in Solomon Islands where I've worked for years, there was a tsunami and people, after the tsunami, there was no, no help. So people used a lot of their governance systems, their traditional systems of knowledge, their traditional systems of tenure to survive that. So those kinds of knowledge, local knowledges are not some romantic idea of local people, but they actually have a very strong importance when you have sudden shocks uh, through, you know, uh, climate change or, or disasters, okay? Anyway, uh, going back to, to a, a focus of uh, the Gulf's work, which also dealt with climate change, and I think Mary spoke about it today, was this idea of looking at people's understanding, because on a daily basis it is people that experience climate change or environmental change in general. And in that, that, in that experience, it's often expanding for decades, you can get actually quite interesting information that you actually can ground truth or compare to scientific data or, hybrid, you know, or match with scientific data and get a much fuller understanding of uh, people's understanding. So, for example, here we have a, you know, a map of mangrove, you know, the one on top on your left, on mangrove coverage and, and one, the other one on water turbidity. We've gone actually done the ground truthing, doing the actual scientific studies of mangrove density and sedimentation in the lagoon. And a lot of the local knowledge actually is very well in, in concordance with, with uh, the scientific knowledge of actually looking at these processes. We've actually done it with coral disease and bleaching. Mind you that the local people cannot distinguish them. So for them, this is, is the same, but a lot of the places that local people are telling us uh, where all these ecological processes are happening, when we've actually ground truth uh, this information with scientific surveys, we found out that they are relatively accurate, which is actually an important thing, because when it's not only about gaining knowledge that is important for resource management, but also working with local people, as I mentioned before, and including them in the scientific process, or the knowledge acquisition process, if you want to call it that. This is also part of our goals work. This actually was the same thing we did in Madagascar as parts of Gloria and parts of Gulls, uh, looking at local knowledge on environmental change across space and time. Mind you that when I do these works, on climate change, that we, we frame them in climate. We never ask people about climate change. We talk about environmental change, right? Because you don't want to, you know, in some ways pollute your sample, give them some preconceived idea that they heard from NGOs or here and there. So when we do these kinds of studies, we always ask about environmental change. And through the people's experience and narratives of change, and we, as I said, we also georeference all that information, especially with the GIS, uh, then you, you actually begin to see also things that are related to climate change, uh, weather pattern changes, salinity, and other things that people are reporting as happening. And I think Mary talked about ethnoceanography. We, we found all these kinds of things going on also in many places. And you see there also a graph of temporality of people reporting changes in Madagascar. And as if you see the last few decades are the ones where all the changes that people are reporting are becoming intensively stronger and stronger. I'm not going to talk about much this, but I've done quite a lot of work on, on, on tourism and looking at uh, mapping people's anticipated impacts of tourism and, again, using geographical information systems to, to, uh, to import georeference data about people's perceptions of conflicts and all kinds of things going on the ocean. And again, this is relevant for coastal and small island communities where coastal tourism is uh, actually, for example, in Solomon Islands, ecotourism and and, to, and, and coastal tourism is now being sold as a salvation for, uh, you know, as a climate adaptive strate strategy when logging and mining and other things and other extractive industries are increasingly failing. Now people are talking about tourism. So again, you know, studying tourism is important uh, and you can do that so at the micro scale to see what, what dynamics can occur in any one community once you begin the, the development process of bringing tourism. And we've done that in Solomon Islands, doing some work for the government and so forth. Again, this is just a GA representation of conflict in one particular area. Also done quite of work on when we talk about rapid ecological change. Uh, I was 
fortunate, I guess, in terms of a research question. I had indigenous knowledge about a particular area, and uh, I also had scientific knowledge of that area because we had georeference and we had the uh, ground truth that that knowledge through underwater visual censuses and running transects and so forth. And suddenly there was a tsunami. So, and that tsunami actually changed the ecological characteristic of that area. So I thought to myself, wow, it would be an interesting time to ask what, what do people perceive has happened in the environment. So understanding how local people actually are able to detect or not ecological change, right? Uh, yeah, this, this is Solomon Islands. So, I'm, okay, I was in Madagascar, now I'm jumping back to Solomon Islands, okay? So if you look at these uh, very simple graphs over time, our sampling years were 2006, that was before the tsunami, 2008, one year after the tsunami, and one and 2010, uh, three years after the tsunami. You see, this is just an example of seagrass and, and sand and silt, while proportions of areas represented by local people are different between the scientific survey and the, and the different villages. Each of these different lines are different villages. You see, so there's science, Buni, Kinamara, Saika. The directionality of change is reported by all the villages, right? So proportions of different areas reported being one thing, another different between the scientific survey versus a local knowledge, but the, 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 the directionality of change is identified uh, by all these groups of people. And that's it's interesting because, I mean, a lot of resilience, that the, the resilience that Alliance are talking about, these are based on people's capacity to understand ecological change. So this was a great opportunity to measure that in some quantitative way and, and to get a much deeper understanding in directionality of people's understanding of ecological change and be able to measure that over space and time. Mind you that all that information would also georeference in the way we, I showed you before. Also done a lot of work for, of protected ecological changes on catches. So basically people are catching similar catches today, but they're going further and spending more time and actually the, the kinds of fishing methods that occur in the region have changed. So we've done a lot of lo long-term analysis, not exactly a, a time series, but sort of comparing different points in time to see what's happening with fishing in the area. Again, bringing a lot of ecological data, a lot of local perceptual data and, and, and measuring that. Anyway, so quickly to wrap up this, this, this thing, uh, what can you do with these informations? For example, you can build a qualitative model. You know, people talk about socio-ecological systems and socio-ecological socio systems, you know, people talk about this, this as these large units of analysis, but these large units of analysis are made of these different bits of information that I was talking about. All these different dimensions are part of those socio-ecological systems. So you can build a qualitative conceptual model, uh, in this case considering two spatial closures and linked with human processes and, and, and human systems. Uh, and again, this is a qualitative model. Uh, that provides an, an, a sort of a, an understanding. You can actually show negative and positive impacts and flows between different uh, parts of the qualitative model. Uh, you can actually eventually construct a quantitative model of current uh, ecosystem services losses, losses and simulate post-climate scenario projections. I actually have a colleague of mine working at CS CSRIO Eva Plagani, who's part of GALS, who, who's working with me in actually figuring out some kind of, you know, way of plugging all of this data to do some kind of modeling on, and predictive modeling of what's going to happen in the area vis-a-vis -vis their coral reefs and the ecosystem services that those reefs are actually going to provide in the near future as the effects of climate change continue to ravage coral reefs in the region. So let me wrap up. A lot of this information, uh, the, and this is not particularly part of GALS, uh, were used to develop a marine, uh, a network of marine protected areas in the region. Mind you that this was in the 90s and early 2000s, and after 20 years, a lot of these marine protected areas have actually failed. So the interesting in, in question is, even with all that information I was telling you about, and all that micro detail information, we've had problems. And, and that's, a different, that's a different story. And, and, uh, I've written a couple of papers about why, and you know, and we can discuss it later. Yes. So, just yeah. 
Well, we, you know, we need to uh, demonstrate how social and ecological driven conservation programs, in this case guided by things like I talked about, coastal human ecology, are likely to be successful socially and ecologically uh, through our close collaboration. And this is, goes back to my point about consilience between natural and social sciences. We have no more time to be bickering about this or that, or you know, the tribalism that exists in, in universities. I think that time is over now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shankar. Really interesting uh, presentation. And, and thank you also for providing us with these uh, theoretical uh, and conceptual also models on, on this. And, uh, and especially the transdisciplinary um, challenge yeah, that we face here at the university. Um, so thank you very much. N now I think we can uh, we can have the. But please stay here. <laughs> Sorry. No, no. Um, um, podemos pegar uma pergunta agora. Acho que temos tempo para uma pergunta para o. Uh, para o professor uh, Azuani, antes de irmos para o, para o próximo professor. Apesar que a gente vai ter uh, 30 minutos para discutir várias uh, questões. Sorry, I'm just explaining first of all in Portuguese before um, uh, we continue. Uh, and I want to take one question uh, from the audience. Se quiser perguntar em português, também pode. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm Sonia Janizella from the Sonographic Institute and Institute of uh, Energy and Environment. And you didn't, uh, you, you don't have the, your um, uh, quantitative model uh, yet, but uh, by your experience, uh, what do you expect about the main trends of uh, losses and the main impact in the economy of these communities? That's a good, that's a good question. And I'm going to speak anecdotally, because while we have all that data, we haven't plugged it in a, in a forecasting model, right? So I don't have a quantitative answer, but I'm going to give you an anecdotal lens. Uh, my, my feeling based on eyeballing the data and what I've seen in trends of what's going on, even though Solomon Islands is probably one of the most ecologically resilient countries because the degradation of the ecosystem has not reached the levels that you find in the Philippines, Indonesia, and other countries that are heavily being exploited through you know, rampant development, rampant overpopulation, even these very small nation scale, you know, countries with relatively small populations are extremely vulnerable. To, to ecological and global changes, because you remember there's dual process, there's distal drivers and there's proximate drivers. Proximate drivers overfishing and uh, runoff sedimentation from logging. Uh, uh, so when you actually factor in these, these ecological processes, not population itself, because only, there's only 600,000 people there. The, the possibility, the, the a scenario looks that a lot of the coral reefs are actually going to disappear, and also with climate change in itself, which is going is weakening these reefs, and we we seen a lot of increase in white band disease, a lot, a lot of increase in uh, in bleaching and so forth. So it seems to me that a lot of these reefs, which seem solid now, are becoming increasingly vulnerable. And in the 30 years I've worked there, I've seen that with my own eyes, anecdotally speaking. So. The, the, the subsistence life that these people have today will be over in the next 25 years, to say it bluntly. And this livelihood is already being plugged by dependency with rice and canned food and so forth being brought from, from Australia and China and other things. And it's crazy because they, they log their forest and mine their, their land to sell, you know, to, to get uh, to imported food, right? By all. So all the, all the money that's being generated at the local level are not re being reinvested in, in, in uh, sustainable 
schemes to generate cash and income and, and you know having some kind of program to adapt to the to climate change but are just sent away in importing foreign food food stuff so it doesn't look very good now so the, the you know the, the trade-offs in the model I mean what the model will show we'll see but but I don't think the forecasts are going to be very good Yes, uh, someone is asking about a break, a small break, but uh, we, can, we can have this way. Uh, when we like to have some coffee, you can just take your coffee and bring here. Então a gente não vai poder fazer intervalo, senão a gente não, não vai conseguir sair daqui hoje. Mas vamos tentar seguir o programa, mas quem precisar se levantar, pegar um café, fica à vontade, pegue o café, volte. A gente precisa... É, Continuar no, no nosso programa, mas fique à vontade, pode ir ali pegar um café e voltar. Sorry, it's Portuguese directions. Ok. Uh, so, if you don't mind, we need to uh, follow up now with our uh, other distinguished um, invitee here. So, it is a pleasure for us to receive now uh, Shiam Salim. Uh, Dr. Shiam Salim holds a bachelor's degree in agriculture from the Kerala, uh, Kerala Agriculture University and a master's degree and a PhD in agriculture economics. So this is an e economics uh, point of view also. Um, he, he, from the Tamil Nadu Agriculture University and also an MBA uh, from uh, Pardichar. Okay, he's currently coordinating the project on cost of vulnerability uh, funded by the Belmont Forum. And Salim is also a part of the NICRA, a network project of the Indian Council of Agricultural Research. And the principal investigator for research on supply chain management of marine fisheries sector in India and its policy perspectives. His topics of interest are resource economics and market research, policy research and international trade, and socioeconomics, vulnerability studies and climate change. So it's very good to have you here and we're gonna just recognize Good afternoon all. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, GRIT Institute. We had a couple of days discussing about future projects and also I take this opportunity to thank Maria Gazella for inviting me and also Shankar to this GRIT Institute. It's been a great time over here. And I think that the BRICS discussions are on. We represent Brazil, South Africa and India. And we had a Chinese and a Russian. Probably we had a much more bigger deliberations going on. So, uh, thank you very much. And also, I take this opportunity to thank you all for coming, taking off your import valuable time, coming and discussing with, with us. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I represent India, and I'm quite happy, and I take all the love and affection from the country to you. Thank you very much for being a part of all the W2 discussions and all the discussions which are going on, which ensures that we compete, the developing countries compete with other big, big countries in the world. So, unfortunately, I don't speak uh, Spanish or Portuguese, so you're saved. And uh, Maria has also have a feeling that my English is more Indian English accent. So, I'll try to reduce it as far as possible so that you get to understand something more in the future. So, uh, people, I'll tell you, uh, I represent um, a research institute called Central Marine Fisheries Institute, which mostly does the fisheries research in the country, especially the marine resources. And we are the part of the government, and we have been very lucky to have enough fund to the tune of around 250,000 US dollars while doing this GULS project. So if you see the kind of work which we did, the scale of work which we did compared to South Africa, we almost got three times more fund. So we were able to do a much more holistic kind of research 
in this process. And GULS was tough. Even the coining of the word, the acronym GULS took almost three months. We choose the word GULS, Global Understanding and Learning for Local Solutions. The discussion was on, leave alone the work. The acronym itself was complex because we need to have understanding between Australians, Indians, South Africans, Mozambique, Brazilians. So we had this topic. But remember, this topic has got a huge impact, actually. Now, we go with the dictum that climate change is global, but its solutions are going to be local. From this, we coined the word GULS. The project was running between 2013 until 2019. She had a late fund dispersal. So because of that, she could extend it until May 2019, whereas India was happy enough to do it for five years until March 2019. And some of the countries weren't lucky enough. They, could, they were able to close it another two or three years, actually. So when I go with this presentation, I thought that we should have a small glimpse of fisheries across the globe. Then it's a good opportunity to talk about India because India and Brazil share similar kind of resources similar kind of resource users, similar policy, and so that I thought we'll have a small discussions about India also, and then we go into the GULS work which we did, the entire, cover, entire ream of work which we did across the social vulnerability, and from there we took it to another extent, what could be done in developing adaptation mitigation options for the future. So this is how the global capture fisheries goes, is around 171 million tons during 2016, in which the capture production is almost 50%. And, but the, the larger picture is almost 33% of the fish stocks are overfished and the global aquaculture is on the rise. And whatever happens, the fish trade is to the tune of 152 billion US dollars in 2017, where we need, to be doing, we need to understand that the third world and the developing countries contribute mostly to the trade. Even we don't have fish for our own consumption, but in the context of keeping the foreign exchange and other things, we ensure that global trade happens. So if you want to see, the per capita consumption of fish in India could be around 7 to 8 kilograms per, per person for a year, whereas in Japan it could be as high as 80 kilograms. So we are basically producing fish, we are farming fish, we are capturing fish for the need of other countries actually. And the dependency on fishing population is also on the rise. So when it comes to the context of India, India is quite huge, around 8,000 odd kilometers with an exclusive economic zone of 2.02 million square kilometers and a continental shelf of 0.5. So we have around nine maritime states. We have four different zones. We have the northwest zone, the southwest zone. We have the southeast zone and the northeast zone. And with around two island territories, four regions. But the fact is, the oceanographic parameters indicate that the west coast where I belong to, where the Elino operations are quite high, is more productive when compared to the east coast. So you can think of climate change. If you talk about climate change, because of the increasing temperature, if the fishes are going to move towards the eastern longitude or towards the northern latitudes, this could have profound influence on the fish availability and the consumption across other parts. So these are the fisheries resources. I'll be sharing this presentation so you could have a, a greater discussions at the later stage. So if you see the economy of Indian fisheries, we are currently third in fisheries production, the total fisheries, and second in aquaculture next to China. The contribution could be around 5.23% of the agriculture GDP, but we employ quite huge 14 million. The contribution to the, the total GDP is 1%, but see the kind of export. We almost export around 10 billion US dollars, and the per capita fish consumption is around nine. I wanted to show this slide because you can just see whether this could relate to a country like Brazil, which is as big as India, or even more, where you have a tropical fishery system, where there is a huge traditional, traditional dependent fishermen, but the mechanized sector contributing the more. So all these are being put into perspective when I frame this slide. So this is the sector-wise contribution. The marine sector contributes more, and if you see the classification of marine fishery, this also has got a huge thing, which uh, the Brazilian system also. If we classify the fisheries into reams, resource, and craft and gear-wise, the reams could be the pelagic and the demersal. We have the cephalopods, the crustaceans. But then if you see the resource-wise, it could be the finfish, the crustaceans, and molluscans. 
But the difficult part comes into how the fishes are being exploited. Now we find the mechanized, the motorized and the non-motorized. But the difficult part is the mechanized catch almost 90% of the fish. But the number of person dependent on marine on the mechanized sector could be as less as 2 to 3 percent. Whereas more and more number of non-motorized people are there, the population, and they harvest very minuscule kind of fish. So it gives a question that a traditional fisherman who owns a boat, on account of his less fishing capabilities in terms of capturing, might end up in becoming a labor in the trawl. So there are ownership issues which is going to come, which might lead to sectoral conflicts in the community by and large. So these are the three different kinds of sectors. When we talk about the mechanized, I talk about the trawlers, the gillnetters, the perceners, the dolnetters, the ring seeners. When I talk about the motorized, I'll be talking about the fiber reinforced plastic boats with liners and seeners. These particular motorized sector go for fishing. The cruise is done, the cruise is done the mechanically, whereas the fishing operations are done manually. Then they, we have the non-motorized, where the dugout canoes, the catamarans, and the plywood boats, which ply into the sea as well as fishing, is done mostly manually. So these are the five major gears which we use, the trawls, the baggonets, the gillnets, seams, and hook lines. And we have different combinations. That's why when FAO tried to put in some modeling for the Indian fisheries, we couldn't do that because of the multiple gear, multiple fleet, multiple stakeholders, all the multiplicity lead to not having any system kind of system when compared to the temperate countries. You could have it speak of a bean model which is used in temperate countries. You could have Atlantic herring, you could have Alaskan polog, but when it comes Peruvian anchovy, but when it comes to India, we have around 2,500 species. So it becomes the modeling doesn't fit into this kind of system. But even then you could see the Indian marine fisheries is surging ahead when compared to the global fisheries. When the contribution of global fisheries is going to come down in terms of marine, the Indian contributions are on the high because we identified newer stocks, we identified newer species, we also identified that the multi-day fishing could lead to more and more fish, all lead to a situation where we all were almost every time, we need to fix the potential fishing yield. We had at 3.93, now we talk about 4.41 million tons, now with the chlorophyll-based fisheries, we might be talking about around 6.5 million tons in the future. So there is always an incentive for the fishermen community to fish more and more. So this is how the sector operates. You could see 83% of the fish comes from the mechanized sector, 14% from the motorized, and hardly 3% from the non-mechanized. So this could lead to property rights, as well as issues wherein the fishermen community could lead to conflicts in the future, which might need political interventions and as well as regulations important in the future. So among the different species, if you see oil sardines, the mackerel, the ribbon fish, other sardines, that is the pelagic contributes more than 60% of the fish production. But again, if you see the national status, our, our fishing resources are still under the category of abundant and less abundant. The collapse of the depleted fisheries are less. We had problems with the catfish some 5-10 years back, but now slowly they are coming back to normalcy. So, this was the species diversity. When I indicate species diversity, it indicates that over the period of time, how many of the species are going to remain across different states. We have around 2,500 species. And again, the species diversity over the years is gradually decreasing by around 7 to 8 percentage. So we have a good fisheries governance also, but the compliance are quite low. We have a constitution of India where we have a federal system. Then we have the different state. Mostly it is open access, and as for the international classification for all the subsidy agreements under the WTO, our fisheries is supposedly considered as small scale. We have input and output control also, but I tell you the compliances are quite low. But with the interventions of the many of the research institute, we are currently having a different systems of input and output control, which makes our life easier, if not difficult. So we have many problems in the fishery sector. We have the sectoral conflicts, we have resource depletion, we have targeted fishing. But again, climate changes also has, has assumed a lot of significance, actually. As an economist, I was always thinking that we need funding for the future. But all of a sudden, during the 2000, 2000 plus, we started taking climate change seriously. So there are huge evidences for rapid climate change as per the NASA. You could have the present and the future, whether the temperature, the ocean warming, the sea level rise, the declining Arctic seas, everything present a threat, not only for the present, but also for the future, which indicates that it's going to be important. 
So the areas affected, it's not only the production in ecology, it could be fishing, it could be communities and livelihood, it could be society and economy, everything could have an impact. So when I started visualizing the marine ecosystem, its impact, the impact of climate change could be three-pronged. One, it could be on the physical environment, it could be on the fishers, it could be on the resource users also. So our most important thrust could be on the sensitive marine resources, like the problems which we had, I list a couple of things. One is, we had problems of catch reductions and species extinction. Some of the species like catfish weren't found, but we had new species like the myctophytes, which has come up in millions of tons, which was available. Because of the ecosystem approach fishing down the web, we had problems of some of the species emerging out. For example, you might be talking, you, you might be knowing of a particular fish called puffer fish. Have you heard about puffer fish? Puffer fish is known as Lagocephalus inermis. It is supposedly a, a fish which is toxic. If you eat that fish, you don't have any options, you'll die. Okay, this is puffer fish. Because this particular fish belongs to the family called Tetrotoxidae, which has got toxins in its, in its gland. And if you take it, you'll simply die. Now, this particular fish was mostly fed by the pomfrets and the sea fishes because they are in the upper trophic levels. But as a result of indiscriminate catching, target fishing, all these fish started going out and all of a sudden the puffer fish started emerging. So we had closely studied this during 2008 until 2018. Remember in 2008, the troll, the troll owners were complaining that all the troll nets were being bitten away by this Lagocephalus inamis, the puffer fish. But then in 2012, what happened is the fishes started com coming in huge quantities. So they started drying this fish and this was being sold in the dry fish market at half a dollar per kilo. Now again this emerged. In 2015, some of the smart Indians, the fishermen community who has got huge indigenous technologies, they started removing this gland. And when they started removing this gland, this was fetching one dollar a kilo. And when the gland is being removed, then probably you could eat. But then again in 2015, this fish started getting exported to China. They pay two and a half dollars per kilo. Now see the economic impact of a climate change. Now earlier you had a very competent sea fish where there were a large number of buyers and sellers, cutthroat competitions, raw metals weren't available, but all of a sudden because of this small technology, of removing the gland, and since it's a white fish, this has got in the market, now this has been a delicacy in Japan and China. Climate change. Climate change for you, man. Now, again we had problems in the pelagic. Now if you see the different kinds of fish which are being caught by the different sectors, the non-motorized, the mechanized, the, the traditional fishermen used to harvest a lot of sardines. The trolls never harvest sardines. But what happened because of climate change? The cli because of climate change, the sardines also thought, let's move. They started moving from the western regions towards the eastern regions. Because of increasing climate change, because of increasing temperature, they started moving from the southern latitudes towards the northern latitudes. Now, think of me, who used to eat fish. I, I represent the southwest part of India, where I used to get the sardines. Now it started going towards Narendra Modi's place. Who is Narendra Modi? Narendra Modi is the Prime Minister of India. He, he is in the northwest part of India where the people don't eat fish. So sardines started going there. Now, again, we, we belong to a place where we fish eat every day. Now the sardines started moving to places towards the eastern part where people eat fish once in a week. Now we had issues in two ways. One, Fish is going to places where it's not being eaten. That is from the southern latitude to the northern latitudes. Now we have issues where fish has started moving from the western towards the eastern latitudes where the people don't eat fish. Then what happened to us? What will happen to the people living in the west coast? The people living in the west coast will have problem of acute fish non-availability leading to lesser consumption. Then all the fish might need to travel from the north to south or from the east to west, all leading to transport, increasing prices, 
carbon emissions and this is leading to a, a difficult fish to breed. Now, when the CPUs are going to come down, then probably the trawlers also will be, will be smart. They understand that let's not do the bottom trawling, let's do the pelagic trawling. And they'll start catching the pelagic fishes. So and there are issues now. So all these resulted in leading to a new concept which you developed, which is known as the sardine famine. Sardine famine. Sardine was around 0.4 million tons in 2012, which has come to around 25,000 tons during 2018-19. So we don't have sardine. Now, the mackerels also start smarter. What did the mackerel do? The mackerel which was caught in the traditional fishermen, now they started feeling it's, it's, it's quite hot up, let's go down. The mackerel started going down. When the mackerel started going down, what happened? The traditional fishermen were unable to catch this fish. They were caught by the motorized in the mechanized sector. What it, what it gives? It gives a situation where the fishermen were unable to catch fish and leading to poverty, unemployment and migration among the non-traditional, the, the, the traditional fishermen. Again, fishes, again, tuna and other things started moving again. They started moving to the next continent actually. So these are issues wherein we understand that climate change has impacted the resources. I tell you when the climate change is going to impact the resources, these resources are being harvested by the fishermen community, mostly the traditional, who are the primary stakeholders and they were unable to get fish. So climate change become important. Now this is the context in which Gulls started intervening. We don't tell that Gulls has done everything, but Gulls has definitely provided an idea, a methodology, an engagement in how we should be dealing with this. So then we developed this concept which is known as the hotspots. What are hotspots? We have been quite familiar about the biodiversity hotspots. But when we started discussing this hotspot, the climate change hotspots, we indicated that these are regions in the globe where the manifestation of climate change is going to be visible prior to other places. So this could act as live labs where we could have adaptation mitigation options, where there is huge pressure and these, could, these results and studies emanating from our studies could lead to better adaptation mitigation options. So we take into two kinds of things. One is the fishery hotspot and the other is the social hotspots. Now what is a fishery hotspot? When I talk about fishery hotspot, I'm, sp I'm speaking about an epicenter of sardine in southwest part of India where they used to be occurring more than 80% total catch in the country. Now because of this climate hotspot, this has been moving, shifting. Now the percentage of fish which comes in the southwest, the epicenter, is less than 50% and the rest gone elsewhere. Now when I tell sardine goes to elsewhere, what happens? One, then the sardine has to come down. Then the sardine may be put to non-food uses. It be, could, would be acting as a fish meal, additive in the fish meal, which will be leading to a carnivorous capture-based aquaculture system where the fishes may not be available. It could be used as a live bait to some of the salmon type of fishing. So that's what we are concerned. And again, we had the social hotspot, where a lot of people are there, the people are going to be affected, which will lead to pressures in migration, unemployment, and people being put into other alternate livelihood options. So this is the basis on which we developed the, the climate hotspot and the Gulls project. And we did this study for the climate hotspots of India. I'll tell you the similar kind of studies are being done in South Africa or Brazil for that matter, everywhere. This is the same kind of work being done. But fortunately, since we had more number of students, more fund available, we could go into some higher levels of work which could still be replicated in countries like uh, in Brazil or in South Africa. That's what we plan in Gulls 2 where we will be taking up to adaptive research as well as climate action oriented research in the areas which we do. Now these are the two climate hotspot regions and uh, when we ask the people like what is, your in what is the impact of climate change in marine fisheries resources, most of them were telling that there is catch reduction, that could be one, there could be increased efforts in fishing and the catch composition changed, all these resulted in lower revenues for the fishermen community. So, the gulls is, becomes unique because all the work which has been done across the five hotspot has been based on this sustained livelihood framework, the DFID model, where we try to modify some of the framework in assessing the vulnerability in indices as well as adaptation and mitigation options. So as I told you, we have been quite fortunate to have a conceptual framework 
these are blanket framework, whether the, that's a questionnaire survey, the scheduled survey, the case study approaches, the focus interviews, everything was uniform across all the climate hotspot region. So these are some of the conceptual framework which we used. And uh, now I'll discuss in another 20 minutes what is that we did in this particular study and what is the kind of engagement we, we, which we did. Now the IPCC model has been used because we thought that has got a uniform, a uniform adaptation. It has been there. It has been applied across. So we also went into this model. The vulnerability is an additive model which we use. Vulnerability is the sum of exposure and sensitivity. And uh, this is totally in cumulative. It is not a potential impact. And there could be adaptive capacities. Exposure relates to all the environmental parameters which couldn't be changed much. Whereas the sensitivity is a situation wherein the current resources and the resource uses are in, not much changes could be done. So these lead to increasing vulnerabilities. On the other side, the adaptive capacity could be the adaptation and mitigation options which will be available, which could lead to reducing the vulnerability. Now, we talk about climate change in the future. When the US, US government was talking about climate change, they told, no, 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 no more vulnerabilities. But then we have a new option called resilience. Now, the climate change scientists are going to redefine this formula now. When we talk about V is equal to E plus S minus AC, now when it's going to be resilience, we are going to talk in a different format. Resilience R is equal to AC minus E plus S. So the climate change funding is going to continue. That's why the Belmont Forum is going to continue its research. So when we did the coastal ground assessment, we took a large households in the hotspot regions, in a, in a part of Kerala where I belong to, that represents southwest region, where we covered 800 households actually. When I talk about a household, it means that a fishing household, which is in the vicinity of, this, of the sea, who are mostly dependent upon the, on fisheries for their livelihood, and their alternate livelihood options could be very minimal. And we used 198 indicators, which was earlier specified by Maria, that we had some parameters of exposure, 36 parameters in exposure, 37 on uh, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity have taken 126. You might be interested to know why we have taken 126. Now, we need to live for the future, so we thought that adaptive capacity is going to be more important than breeding on the exposure and sensitivity parameters, so we took more adaptive capacity parameters, which could give the adaptive adaptation and mitigation plan and also help us to know where we are going for the future. So we also did some mapping in QGIS wherein each and every households were ranked for their vulnerability and so we could know that this particular household is more vulnerable when compared to others so that in the context of disaster management, we will be easily able to choose the households and to give specific location, location training as well as governmental support could be given. So, we did the survey and uh, the questionnaire was quite huge, but we need to maintain uniformity, so we had a huge questionnaire. We developed a vulnerability assessment based upon different parameters which could lead to and reduce. We had a scoring method methodology which was done by the Gulf International team. And from the two locations, we could reach at figures of 2.85 and 2.80. These are the, for the two study locations, but then you see 2.80 adds to vulnerability, sensitivity adds to vulnerability, Exposure adds to vulnerability and the adaptive capacity is 2.52. Now, any mission in doing this particular work to reduce vulnerability could be to improve the adaptive capacity. So all our mechanisms were to improve the adaptive capacity. So these are the different kinds of indicators which we used. If you see the adaptive capacity over here, there are 126 parameters which could mostly lead to attitudes and perceptions, flexibilities, the personal occupation institution, the different capitals, the social, natural, human, financial, and physical, capa physical capital. So these are the thematic areas wherein we could improve the adaptive capacity for the future, which could be given indicators in ability to adapt, adaptation, the risk level, the degree of anxiety, the idea to sustain local fisheries, and the knowledge good fishery processes. So the same kind of questionnaire was being dealt in in Brazil as well, South Africa also. They are in the process of uh, arriving at this kind of, uh, this kind of scores. And uh, this is how the vulnerability b behavior comes, actually. So these are the, these are the places. Oh, it doesn't work. Oh, it doesn't work over there. So you, you could see the, the blue color indicate the regions of the sea. 
and where the different kinds of parameters are being indicated, the different color gradients, yeah, the different color gradients indicate that what is the current level of vulnerability. If you put a grid into it, you could also go into individual households and see which are the most vulnerable households actually. So when I indicate four, it means that maximum vulnerability, hugely vulnerable. Anything in the range of 2.85, Yeah, it's small. It's, it's okay. So uh, this is the plotting the entire vulnerability map into perspective. So we have done this for the exposure. So if you see this color, color gradient, then you know that which are the households which are mostly vulnerable in terms of exposure. Then we did for the sensitivity and for the adaptive capacity. Now one of the advantage of our study was all the study reports which have developed in the context of this particular work has been communicated to the local self-government. This is one of the linkages which we develop in the context of the study. We know that uh, climate change is global, the adaptation mitigations are going to be local. So in the process of doing this particular kind of work, we gain confidence of the local cell government. It's a county or a village, or it could be the community in your context. We talked to those leaders and told that this is what we are planning to do. We seek your support. So they were also party to it. We had inception workshops where the, the policy planners, the governmental people, the counselors, and, and the different senators in that particular area were contributing into it. They were sensitized. They were also telling that people should participate. So this ensured that the kind of reliability in the data was quite high. And also we wanted to engage the best people who could do the enumeration of this particular data could be the people from the community. So what we, what we identified that the people were from the community were taken as the people who did the survey, which were monitored by them and the planning process was done and they did the survey and the data collection so the reliability of data was quite high. It was quite surprising to find that when we did a 350 or 400 survey we could almost had the competent data around 95 percent. The outliers was less than 5 percent which indicates a better data set. So when we talk about adaptive capacity this particular QGIS information provides an idea about what which are the families which could lead climate change adaptation options in the future, that's the adaptive capacity. Now again, we understood that because of the climate change, the resource use are going to be affected in terms of migration, income, fishing industry, unemployment, health issues, poverty, loss of power, property and livelihood. So you can understand that this is how it is going to operate. Now, you speak about migration. Think of a country like the Middle East where a lot of, lot of people from the other world goes. Now we are migrating for better livelihood options. Likewise, there is a case of the fisher, young fishermen youth are no more interested to be in fisheries. They are moving out of fisheries. Now, we need to fill in the gap actually. So who is going to fill in the gap? For resource rich coastal states which has got huge fisheries production, for example you talk about Gujarat, Karnataka and Kerala which are in the southwest, there is oceanographic factors where there is huge amount of fish, we are not into fishing more. Now what happens? People will come from other states which are resource poor fishery states and they come and finally there is migration and the people who are having skill, attitude and knowledge in fisheries don't want to fish. Instead, we are going to have a team of people who lack fishery skills but in seek of employment they came down. So all these are going to create differential problems. So we also wanted to know that in the context of climate change, vulnerability, what are the different alternate livelihood options which are available. So we want to take it to the government and we did a survey and to our understanding we found that the climate change adaptation measures are going to be important and this is what they felt. The waste disposal are to be reduced, the increasing energy efficiency are going to play a pivotal role and the preferred livelihood options we found that the top five ALOs by the fisher folks include they are moving from fisheries, a hugely skilled labor to daily wage labor. They are interested to be a part of self-help groups where they get less than $5 a day. They are going to have some small scale industry or the service industry or they are even interested to become a mason or a carpenter. This indicates that there is a huge social and human capital which has to be going to be lost in the process of, in the process of climate change. So our interactions with the government had been instead of putting them into moving from fisheries, let's think of options where we could have cage culture. We could have ornamental fish culture. 
we could have value additions we could have small inland fisheries activities we could have small tanks and ponds so that we could retain these people in the fisheries activities and again when we started to think about climate change the blue carbon economy is going to be important through green fishing so we wanted to see we did a life cycle as analysis wherein in the process of producing 1 kg of fish what is the amount of carbon dioxide being emitted as you know for every 1 liter of diesel being used around 2.6 to 2.7 kg of carbon dioxide is being emitted so we wanted to see this and to see sustainable green fishing like the organic farming in agriculture is it going to provide an incentive for the fishermen community that is they produce 1 kg of fish in the mechanized visavi motorized as well as non traditional what is the amount of carbon dioxide which is going to be emitted so to a surprise if you see the traditional fishermen in the in, in the process of catching 1 kg of fish they produce around 110 grams of carbon dioxide whereas if it is for motorized they produce 1.46 kg of carbon dioxide for every 1 kg of fish produced whereas the mechanized is going to produce 2.24 so what does it mean in the debate of reducing reducing climate change we are bound to reduce carbon dioxide emission and in that case the traditional fishermen are going to have a green incentive because they reduces lesser carbon dioxide in the process of harvesting so as per the kyoto protocol or the green fishing and the green tax we foresee that in the future of another 10 20 years we will be having a situation where each and every fish the salmon the sardines which are going to be tagged in the supermarkets will be having a tag that okay in producing this particular fish only lesser carbon dioxide has been emitted so which is going to have a better prices again it was important that the results need to be engaged with the fishermen so fishermen engagement were important and we identified climate change agents in the study areas the climate change agents could be the four categories of experienced fishers they they can on mode of fisheries they need to be retained in either cage culture ornamental fish culture inland fisheries there were women who are going we are considered to be very important with the kind of gender empowerment which happened in 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 india because of the different self help groups which have been mostly successful women then we thought there is a huge youth which is available because india is a country where more than 60% of the population is young and also the children's are going to be the future as per the darwinian theory with child is the father of man we thought that the children also need to be taken on board when we are going to develop climate change plans as well as climate change leader so the experienced fishers the committed women the proactive youth and the articulate children were taken on board when we develop the climate change adaptation mitigation plan in the later stages consequent to the, the the different studies which we did in social biological as well as modeling things so we end up developing the developing this framework which is known as crevamp which indicate climate resilient village adaptation and mitigation framework now what we meant by village so the smallest unit of development in any country could be the county or the village and the indian context in each and every village has got a local self government we thought that there should be a crevamp that is a village adaptation mitigation plan which has to be embedded in the in the development plan of the village in which we use all these elements approaches and outcome which includes awareness preparedness adaptation mitigation and the different approaches leading to a village climate information system or it could be climate communities it could be green fishing and the adaptation mitigation plan and the success of our project for now has been the outcomes all the outcomes required for the crevamp has been undertaken in the villages where we did now this has been communicated to the government there is a ministry of ministry of environment and climate change now we have each and every state governments has a department of climate change so all these has been embedded into the plan and also we thought that it's quite difficult to think of a, a top down approach because we talk about local solutions so we thought that the bottom up approach is not going to be important because when we talk about climate change the fishermen community by and large were not aware about climate change they were not aware about climate change so the first difficulty for us or the achievement of this particular project has been communicating climate change to the fishermen community as a science as a science rather than a mere happening now i take this a, a wonderful example 
I was talking about climate change, the people, they were not knowing climate change. But they knew one thing. We had a very particular flower which comes during the month of April in India. It starts with the agricultural year. That starts with the agriculture year. That flower is known as Cassia fistula. Cassia fistula comes up during April. Now, because of climate change, what happened is Cassia fistula never came. Cassia fistula became smart. They thought that they doesn't have an economic value. They started blooming up in December. So, Cassia fistula became a point of contention. Cassia fistula, which used to be very a uh, free fish, a free flower, which we used to go and pluck as, as a small kid, now started appearing in, in December. Now, when it came to April, it, be, it becomes important and customary for all the households to have this as the first eyesight during the month of April. Now, it became priced. People like Shankar and Maria, who had the cashier official in the house, they were not giving me. They were telling, no, 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 Shyam, you are my good friend, but the problem is, we have a market now. We have a market for cashier fistula. A small bunch of cashier fistula could be around one dollar. Now, when this thing started appearing, then people started thinking about climate change. Now, taking this example of cashier fistula, we met the fishermen and told, see, you used to get sardine earlier, you're not getting sardine earlier. Now the sardine has shifted towards the, the, the east and the north. They understood fisheries. They understood climate change. For them, early climate change was a loss in fishing day because of erratic monsoon or an extreme weather event. They were equating climate change only to extraneous weather or loss in fishing days. It was quite difficult to communicate to them. And maybe this kind of traditional knowledges were helping us to communicate climate change as a sign. So we thought that the bottom approach is not also going to be successful. Then we came up with a new concept, which is known as the balancing of result, wherein we use the traditional wisdom of the fishermen, that is the bottom up, and the funding and the policy suggestions from the government, taking the plan, converting the plan into budget, everything was done by the top-down approaches. So also, all the projects have a problem. The project has a problem because unless until the project is running, the, the area seems to be, be better, everything goes well, but when the research project is complete, the manuscripts are being done, when the funding flow is stops, we just leave it. So it's important to have a very good exit strategy from each and every project. So we thought that when Sham and others are going to leave this particular project, let's make a, a good dent into the particular area, and we thought that we need to develop communication tools so that the kids, the youth, the women, everybody to take it to a larger levels. So we thought that climate education is important. We developed a series which is known as the climate and we started in different languages. We did it for Hindi so that everybody could use it. We, could, we had the regional languages, Malayalam and Tamil, we, where we developed five different series. One is knowing a warming planet. Now, when we started discussing this, most of the undergraduate students, when you ask them, what is the difference between climate change and variability, many students couldn't answer. When we ask the question of what is the difference between weather and climate, still people grapple in the dark. So we thought that knowing a warming planet, learning and coping in climate change, what is the societal role, climate change and policy, households in combating climate change, are these all are small manuals which gives an understanding that how everybody could contribute. Now, for example, you don't know that a, a, a tube light, 40 watts tube light, if it runs for 24 hours, it is going to emit one kilogram of carbon. That's one unit of electricity. So we were trying to educate them through this particular mean, the climate series. And also we did continuous trainings and workshops. And we wanted to see how the students perceive. So we did climate change, painting competitions, awareness workshops, one act plays, street plays, all these things to be done to ensure that the students get to know. And again, it was communicated to the people and also percolated down to the different, different strata of the community. So these are some of the painting competitions. These are something which was done by 10 to 12 year old kids and what they understood climate change. And we were also quite lucky that when all of the presentations when you do, we could highlight some of these cases. So we, were, we also had a non-Googled uh, slides which were also used. So, and all our work, 
became prominent and we did one there is a binale which happens every year in, in, in Cochin you could go and we did one which is not the fish symmetry when we did the climate change one of the things which emerges was the kind of plastic which was disposed into the sea so we thought that the, the disposal of plastic into the sea creates two kind of issues one the plastic will be fed by the fishes because they are going to die that's mortality at one level and the second level of mortality could be the small plastics could enter into the fish at micro levels and could lead to the fishermen the, the human consumption leading to some health hazards in the future so we coined a beautiful word called fish symmetry so what fish symmetry means is these are the installations these are basically done in jute and uh, it's covering the uh, iron uh, steel and iron rods these were installed during 2017 we got around a 0.5 million hits we had in this so this was a case where there's a youtube movie also which could be seen so that's how we try to communicate climate change and plastic which is also leading to climate change to the community but again i'll tell you the kind of linkages which we developed so prior to 2012 i was uh, 12 to 14 i was known, mostly known as an economist working in marketing trade in economics but now uh, we got recognition of working in climate change the kind of institutes the rots the the csiro the sao paulo maria and the different kinds of institutes and again we had better stake often the research institute doesn't have better stake with the government when we talk such kind of project leading to the end users in changing their lives probably the visibility of the institute as well as scientists also is in the rise so we had better linkages with the government the federal government the state government and we could even go and speak to the local self governments so the scientist visibility is on the high we are being felt that we are important citizens to research as well as development and also these are some of the local self governments which started taking climate change on a serious note uh, we had huge communications coming up the adaptation mitigation plan have been taken well and also we started numerous options for providing livelihoods and also the pro the project was successful in developing a lot of overflow projects actually we did the pyre with the us we had lenfest with the csiro we continue to be working with michigan state universities and one of the purposes where we had met in addition to this kind of seminar is to develop collateral researchers again numerous uh, transdisciplinary research projects with all of us so that we could take these projects to higher levels with more adaptive researchers so to put in a nutshell if i see what is the achievement of our girls in india and across the globe could be the most significant has been we could transfer climate change as a science to fishers now as a scientist i sit there listening to the fishermen community they come and tell sir we have a lot of indigenous technical knowledges which could curb climate change and we learn from them so the dialogue has been mutual we have been discussing with them and again we could also include climate change and its impact into the local cell government planning mechanisms so they also allocate a certain kind of fund for the fishermen community so that in the event of disasters in the event of losing income through climate change impact they are having alternate livelihood options either in terms of training different programs have been shelved into it this has been done and also now if you go to the village and ask are there any climate change champions yes we have we have climate change champions like it could be some women it could be some fishermen it could be some kid it could be some youth all coming into the forefront and they are very much available in telling what is climate change and they used to the different other than the operas and the different serials they also talk about climate change at home so it's going to be good and again linkages and the most significant has been climate change which has been perpetuated the tropical sector we could do a small dent into it and we have been doing but as i'll tell you we couldn't be so happy because again the difficulty of climate change to the fishermen is going to continue because for the different changes happening in the environment with the different different kind of exposure and sensitivity we may not be able to completely communicate and also all the all the things which is happening in the globe cannot be cannot be given only to climate change and again there is a cost to the exchequer the government is happy that climate change is going to happen like the other day but now because of intervention we are going to tell the government that okay please understand one thing because of this climate change you are going to incur this much losses 
Leave, we have seen that the losses in the shrimp industry in Brazil to the tune of 7.4 million US dollars. This could be the cost. Now, we did some studies in the sardine famine. Sardine which was available to the traditional fishermen is not available. The sardine, the sardine famine has resulted in around 120 million US dollars to the, to the economy for the past two years. And again, for the kind of skill set, the kind of inertia for the fishermen community to move, finding alternate adaptations are, are less important and the value chains are to be important because in, in India, the present state is the fish landings has come down by 10 percent, but the prices of fish has gone up by 15 percent. Now the fishermen are not finding the shock of climate change because the reduction in the landings has been negated by the increase in fish prices, but that's not going to continue. So value chains are going to be important. And whatever you tell the fishermen, the fishermen are happy having a siesta in front of the, in front of the beach rather than going and staying in concrete houses. Now this is where we find difficult. The government because of tsunami has constructed many houses for the fishermen. But after three, four months when you come, you will find that the fishermen is still staying in the, in the same place. They don't want to come and stay in the concrete houses because their socio-cultural things their ecological mindset doesn't allow them to be staying in, in concrete houses. So the resistance to move to their present ambience could be a bigger, more challenge. But at the outset, I'll tell you, this has been great working with girls. And now we are being recognized that we could make some changes in the lives of fishermen. I wish girls continue in some other format. Also, the linkages with the international scientists across the globe and uh, is going to continue and we'll have a better future to live in. Thank you very much. So before I complete, I should also acknowledge the Belmont Forum for supporting this great work and uh, the project partners has been great. I, I would have never known uh, Shankar Aswani, who has an Indian descent some uh, 100 years back, we could meet and uh, that's a great thing. And I never uh, had a, a time to party with uh, Maria in in, in Brazil, if not, this project has been there. And also, the ministry is also keen. And the most important thing is, the fishers has been quite supportive in providing quality and reliable data. And the work has, the, because I, if, for me to sit here, I'll tell you this has been huge for the kind of students have involved, 10 to 15 students, maybe around uh, 800 to 1,000 fishermen households, meetings, all these has been done because of them. My acknowledgement to all of these people, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Shyam. Thank you so much. It was really great to see the, the progress in, in India and also the, the strong cultural component that we could appreciate. And especially because India is a large fish producer, right? Um, my proposal to now is to get some questions to you before we start the, the panel discussion. Um, então, se tiver perguntas da plateia, pode fazer em português. Agora a gente vai dirigir as perguntas mais para para a palestra do do Xian. Well, uh, you, you said. Th oh, uh, I am Alexandre Guiar. I am university professor at Uninove in São Paulo. Well, uh, I well, you, you thank it for uh, the, the the fishermen for the precious information, precise information that you got. Well, uh, how do you get them to, to give you precise information on the amounts of fishes they they catch? Uh, do you get this from them? Because uh, uh, in, in Brazil, sometimes it's difficult to get a scale or to get them stop their work to check uh, the, the, the sizes or to get some, some quantification of the fish. Uh, when I talk about gulls actually, gulls became a prestige for our institute, like we wanted to work it. So if you see that kind of data sets, the data sets weren't provided only by gulls alone. We had projects on the economics of fishing operations. We have projects on the marketing of fish. We have, we have projects on the socioeconomics of fishermen community. We have projects on the credit facilities available. So 
lot of data which has been carried out on a panel basis. Panel data are available over the period of time. Maybe I started coming and working in the institute for the last 10 years, but our institute has been collecting this information for the past 30, 40 years actually. We have got fishermen who are looped into our, our survey, who are being paid money for providing the data sets, and because of that we get reliable data. And one more thing is, uh, it's always a, a, a privilege for a fisherman community to be too involved in this kind of work. So the, all the 800 fishermen who are involved in this particular activity, they have been involved in many of the meetings actually. And the kind of social recognition which has been given to them also added to their interest in this particular work. And when we come to data collection, it's always difficult to uh, get data, reliable data, if I go and interview. And my research scholars go and interview. So we developed a good mechanism which has, which has come up in a in our, in our joint publication which indicates that in India, the method of data collection has been a, a larger process. We went and discussed with the local self-government. We told them this is what we are going to do. This is going to be the possible benefits. And based on that, the community was sensitized. We had people coming into the, into the fray. We needed some 20 to 30 fishermen, young fisherwomen, who were part of this particular study. They were trained to collect the data. And since they were part of the data and they were paid for the data collection, they were paid. The fishermen, the respondents were not paid, but the people who helped us in the data collection were paid. So we ensured that this kind of data is being collected. In addition, we had triangulation methods wherein we cross-check the data. We had other projects based on which the data collection was ensured. Thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon. My name is Deborah. I'm Mary's student. And I have a question. I've been in some communities doing field work, and I could see that most of the fishers, uh, the, com the whole community, are not concerned about climate change sometimes. They have other emergency demands, like keep fishing or have space and this kind of things. And I, I think about how we can uh, propose some discussions uh, measures, adaptations, um, ways for them without impose a top-down um, a top-down way of, of policy. It, I don't know if it's clear. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Okay. Yeah, how can understand. we how, how can we start make them think about this is important? Not not uh, they don't think it's not important, but they have another concerns. And how can we help them to understand that it really affects them? Actually, what we find in our studies was, when we, when we studied the impacts of climate change on the marine ecosystem, we had three-dimensional approach, actually. One is climate change is impacting the environment, climate change is impacting the resources, and the resource users. The resource users were in a direct cost. The direct cost had been the environmental changes, the environmental changes resulted in the resources and then the fishermen are going, getting affected. So the community was affected last. It, it might be quite difficult to communicate to them, but they had problems of sea level rise. Yeah. So they know that they need to displace themselves quite often. They had temperature rises because the fishermen community who used to be uh, staying at houses need to pay high electricity bills because of increasing consumption of electricity. So they were feeling at one end. On the other side, they used to catch fish. The major, major source of dependency is fish. And they're subsistence fishermen. They were not getting fish. And we had ground truthing done, indicating that climate change has affected some of the resources, which we used to be caught by them, and that is affecting their income. So when they understood that these kind of climate change impact on the resources are directly affecting the livelihood, there was a need for migration. There was a need for in improving income. And then they felt that climate change impact is going to be needed for them. So when you are able to have science communicated to them based on the scientific research that is going to impact them, not only now and for the future, then probably their level of involvement is to be higher. Fortunately, in the case of India, when we had such large kind of sample, we could actually, we, we could actually target that particular community which is hugely affected. And which was very well supported by the environmental data, as well as the fisheries change, the phenological distribution shift also lead us a better work.
Thank you. Hi, my name is, is Maria do Carmo. I am a, a biologist. I work at an uh, environmental agency here in Sao Paulo State. Uh, my skill is about the, uh, the point of view the, in these models. If it's considered uh, bloom, uh, algae blooms and fish mortality in this concept. I don't know, I, I didn't see. I, I, I saw the, the change of uh, phytoplankton communities, but uh, blooms, uh, algae blooms, I, I think it's very important because uh, here uh, in Sao Paulo state, we have a feeling is increased these uh, blooms uh, in the last years. I don't know your feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what we did in under the Gulf's transdisciplinary approaches, we never had really social systems in mind. We had the biology, we had the modeling, we had the oceanographic parameters, all things were included. So when we were to come to a conclusion where climate change is impacting fisheries, then we also did some models like the the seas model, the sea mice model, we did the Atlantis, we did the ecosystem, the ecopath, all these models, the ecopath models and all, take into consideration the different trophic levels and then we see how much it is impact, impacting and also sensitive analysis towards each and every species was also done. So we have taken that also into account but my, disc, my presentation never went into such details actually because we basically interested to do the vulnerability analysis alone. So that has been taken into account. Okay. That's why when we identified the hotspot, we had two things in mind. One is the fishery hotspot and the second is the social hotspot. The fishery hotspot was taken because we understood that when we did the dynamic framework analysis, that these are some of the statistical methodologies or the sea mice model, all these indicated that over a, over a spatial temporal analysis, if you do, there has been decreasing trend of the fish landings over the years. Yes, I, I just want to comment on, on, on this because it, it's very important, the, the algal blooms, uh, and it also affects some local scale uh, of, of communities. In Brazil, especially the one that uh, has some aquaculture, and like the oysters, uh, people, um, so algal blooms are very important. But it looks like the scale uh, the time scale of algal blooms sometimes really are not have not good resolution in this kind of models that he, he's mentioned, and the frequency of, of these kind of events. This is why maybe the heat wave uh, uh, idea, for instance, can help understanding our, uh, algal blooms and how it can affect the, the production, eh? the producers. Right? But I think it's a very good point. Thank you. Just a quick comment on, on the Solomon case studies. We've, we've been doing a little bit of work on algal blooms because there's an issue of climate change and there's also a, a lot of runoff sedimentation related with logging and other activities that are, seem to having an effect on the intensity of these algal blooms. So what we've been measuring this, we've had a, some team doing the biological work to understand the, the ecodynamics that are creating this, but also we've been focusing on the impact in livelihood. So we've been looking at the communities and how they're responding to this. And actually one of the things we were thinking with Eva is bringing the algal bloom factor into our modeling because that's something that was not accounted for before, but is increasingly becoming important even in a place like Solomon Islands. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, my name is Alina. I am an oceanographic undergraduate student. And uh, my question is, uh, here in Brazil, the fishermen get involved in the data collection. And uh, they seem to be, it's, uh, they demonstrate to be honor uh, of giving this, this information for us when we ask it them. And uh, however, the laws continue to be, to came from upside down. 
uh, in the government. And uh, in India, in your presentation, it seems to be a little bit different. They have a, a strong relationship. Uh, which are the points that you, the principal points that you think that mm, make the, the, that support this relationship? Because here uh, in Brazil, the fishermen don't, uh, uh, isn't really friendly with the government and things like that. Actually, this is not a problem with uh, Brazil alone. It's a problem everywhere. For example, uh, you can't go in this dress and collect data from a fisherman community. And uh, when you go for survey, they always mistake you for, they w uh, sometimes they would don't in give information because they consider that you are income tax people. Okay. So you won't get the information. Sometimes if we tell that we are going to select some of you, some of you as our support staff, then they'll give actual information. And also, collecting the data has always been difficult, actually. That's why in our kind of work which we do, I always go, instead of we going, we will hire somebody from the community which could have better impact from others. For example, if, I, if you go and ask somebody, what is your income? If I ask Shankar, if he's a fisherman, if I ask him what is his income, he's going to thrash me. Yes, he's going to thrash me. But then I, if I ask him, what is his savings, then also he'll not thrash me, but he'll just tell, I don't have any savings. But now I'll, I'll go with a different question. What's your expenditure? Then he'll be very happy to tell. He'll tell my expenditure comes to this, 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 this. And if I ask him, what are your loans? Then he'll tell, big loans. But then what we need to do is, the expenditure could act as a, proxy for income. We have a small formula, expenditure, expenditure plus loans is equal to income plus savings. So we need to develop different approaches to ensure that the data collection needs to be done. But as a researcher, if you want to go and collect data, please understand one thing, that the fisherman in the short run is not going to get any benefit from the data which they're going to give. And the short-term benefits are only for us. Either the completion of the project, your PhD being awarded, or the sub or a manuscript being done. But this is something in the long run, because our projects, our manuscripts should be submitted to the, to the funding agency. They consider this as a policy implication. They give it to the government. They make it into a plan. They convert it into a budget. And then there'll be programs running around. So I always go to the community begging that this kind of information is required. I'm very, very simple in it. So then only you'll get information. But the fishermen are always uh, having an inertia to share the information. But once when they feel that they need to give, if, you, if, you, if, if, you find, if they find that you are a part of their community, if your interest is really true, then probably then the dimensions might change. So our interest, that's why if you see some of the, some of the papers, if you see, instead of going for many, very many samples, now there is another trend of work where the, the, the researcher goes and stays in the place, they do case studies, they stay with them, observational, that's the kind of thing which we are going to do. So I think the, the having large number of samples is going to make way for his kind of research wherein you could go and stay there, a three or four typical case, case studies represented with samples could lead to what is the behavior in the community. So it's going to be always a sociological approach, a psychological approach is always important. And that's going to be a successful one. Yes, I have a comment on, on, on just to, to follow her, her question. How many fishers uh, do you have? Is there any uh, assessment of the number of fishers in India? I mean, coastal uh, fishers? You have this number? It's, it's 14 million actually, 14 million. But we have around 1 million active fishermen. 1 million. 1 million active fishermen. But then the, the, the difficult part is, the 1 million fishermen is having only less than 10% of the catch. 90% of the fishermen is having 10% of the catch. And 10% is having 90%.
So we have a paradox. If it is to continue, then probably we are going to be difficulty. But fortunately, the government, like in the Brazil, all the fishery policies are skewed towards the traditional fishermen. Yeah, they, they know it. Uh, just to catch up to your question, I think I think um, um, it was partially answered, but. Um, one, one thing that's important is first, what your research question and the resolution that you want. And, and there are proxies that you can use to kind of get to, to certain information. But one of the points I was trying to make is that, you know, I've worked in these kind of large scale projects where you go and you do some sampling, right? And, and, and you get information that's doubtful and, and often is because the fishermen don't want to participate in these, in these, these exercises. So that, that begs the question, really, what do you actually need? And, and I think part of the whole point of my presentation what the, is that there is no way around in building the social capital in a local community so that you can actually access that information. And that, and that is, is difficult and also brings to bear uh, uh, a very important issue, that of resolution. Then you may have a lot of resolution, but then your sample size might be much smaller than these national scale studies. Uh, but we've done a lot of these national scale studies and, and you know, when I actually scale down to the local scale, I found that the, the information is extremely unreliable. And not only that, is in fact, as you spend time in any one community, remember that when you go and sample in one community, you may spend one week or two. The perceptual data you're capturing at that moment is based usually in secondary rationalizations of, of what's going on and at that time. If you spend the whole year in that community and look at the spatial temporal variability of foraging and, and movement of different, you know, you might actually find that fishermen become generalists and then become specialists and they shift, the for, you know, their foraging activities over space and time. You would see a whole annual cycle of behavior. You cannot capture that from a quick survey in a quick visit to a quick village, even if you had them being, you know, even if they collaborate, which is actually not the case in most of the time. Because in most of places, even in fact now, there's so many PhD students doing research all over the world. I, I have a project in Tanzania, and often the people that I go talk to have been interviewed like 10 times. They, they say, go away. Piss off. You know, go away. Right? So we, you, you challenge to, to then, then you ask yourself, what kind of information are we able to collect? Uh, and this is why I said today with this whole human ecologist thing, is that, we, you know, in getting good data, there's no way around spending a lot of time in building social capital with the community. This is very important, uh, and I think it is also related to the question of scale and resolution, right? Because we have the temporal scale and, and, and also the special scale and the variability, right? Like, like the, in the climate, we also have this in fisheries and, and local. Surveys, right? Uh, very interesting. One more yeah, I yes. would like to make a question oh, for I'm Shankar, not. please, if I can. <laughs> for him. Yeah, my question is like you said that a good way to design an MPA would be to bring like the scientific approach and the local knowledge approach. And I would ask you if you have some difference between both of two, this approach, like he, the community says a thing and the scientific biological approach it says a different way. What would, how would be the ethical things for a, for a researcher to do, for a designing an MPA, if you are actually building a, a, a confidence with the community, you know, I think it's an ethical <laughs> dilemma if we have it. Well, it, it's, it's a good question. And, and for me, I mean, personally, I, I am trained as, as an ecologist and a, an anthropologist. So I don't struggle with some of the things that a lot of, a lot of the humanists do. Right, but but just just to bring the Solomon Island example for a moment, uh, when we did the ground truthing of uh, benthic, abiotic and biotic substrates, correspondence was between 60 and 75 percent. If you look at remote sensing ha sensing habitat mapping that a lot of scientists use in their habitat classifications for 
their resolution and, and, and their guessing of the pixels that they're reading from remote sensing is about 40 to 50 percent. So actually the performance of indigenous people were as, was as good or even better. So in this sense, we didn't have a problem in using uh, uh, indigenous knowledge because indigenous knowledge was very complementary to scientific. <coughs> Excuse me. And the kind of habitat uh, substrates, that they, the, the kind of substrate, benthic, uh, the biotic and abiotic substrates that they were identifying in their emic categorization of their habitat was very similar to the scientific one. So there was really no, uh, there was no, you know, I would say big difference between these two forms of knowledge. Now, the question is, if there is a big difference, right, then, then what do you do? <clears throat> I think it's a very difficult and challenging question because you cannot just say, well, we use science and your knowledge is crap, right? You're not going to say that. But, but I think the ways of working with communities that you can create, you know, you can create maps based on local knowledge in participatory mapping GIS, for example, that show their knowledge and then bringing some of the components. And, you know, you, th this is an educational curve where you say, well, you know, you know your, education, your local knowledge is okay, but we went and we found out that there was this and that going on. And, and, and indigenous knowledge does not know everything, right? And I think, you know, pretending that, you know, indigenous knowledge can tell all, all, all it's, it's also, you know, I work with local knowledge and I think it's important, but I think it's also important to hybridize with other forms of knowledge, in this case, Western science. Right? You know, problematizing this issue. Well, you know, the Western science is coming here to, to you know, to, to you know, to, you know, how do you say, dictate what happens. You know, it doesn't. It's not a black or white thing. You know, you can find bridges between these knowledges and create, you know, compromises so that both knowledges can be included in a system. Yeah. Yes, it looks to me that. Uh uh, Shankar's answer reflects that he's not a typical anthropologist. He's, he's mostly an anthropologist and that work together with uh, environmental uh, scientists, right? Because, you know, this, this is a good point that, for me, that she raised, uh, especially because um, conservation agencies or environmental agencies that take care of, for instance, marine protected areas, um, settlement and definition and the areas definition in some places and some countries like ours sometimes rely more on in ecology right because they are mostly similar to terrestrial ecosystems right they they have this bias on terrestrial ecosystems ecology that can be applied to marine um, ecology sometimes right and so they, they, they generally rely more on uh, ecological data. But you know, ecological data are not that accurate at the local level as well. We don't have that uh, uh, magnitude of studies at, even in, at the local level, even you know, ecological studies or and, and traditional knowledge, right? Uh, but I, I think that one important thing that he mentioned is that in the definition of the case studies that he showed us about the marine protected area, it was my impression, at least, that they were all defined based in local knowledge. Differently that here, for instance, that a government defined the areas that should be protected even without knowing anything about the, the arrangements, the local uh, and, and, and traditionality of people living there, you know, there are just areas that uh, sometimes are defined in a top-down approach, like government said, the, the, the areas. And I think that what he was uh, telling us, especially in this Oceania uh, coral reefs of Solomon Islands, were that the marine protected areas were really um, defined, the areas were defined based on the traditional knowledge. Am I right? Or could you please comment on that? Yeah, I, I, think, I think first of all you have to look at the jurisdictional context, right? Solomon Islands is a place where the constitution recognizes that beyond the mean high water mark, the ocean belongs to, the, especially coastal areas, also belongs to the indigenous people, right? 
That's the first question to, to understand. Here in Brazil and Europe, it doesn't. It belongs to the state. I think three, three nautical mi miles is probably the region, and then 12 nautical miles is, this, is the government, and beyond to the EEZ is, is the exclusive economic zone. So we're looking at a different, at, uh, you know, the governance system and the law system behind is one that is completely different. Now, working in the context like Solomon Islands, where you, even if you want it, and even in, here in Brazil, the, the territory is so vast that even a top-down doesn't work because there is no monitoring of, of capacity of enforcement. So in Solomon Islands, where you have this governmentability context, the, you know, first of all, there is no other context to work around. So it's not the issue of being an anthropologist and romanticizing indigenous knowledge and tenure rights, notwithstanding that there are issues of environmental justice that are important to talk about. Let's be, but let's be pragmatic for a moment. There is no way around. Whether you like it or whether you agree, whether you come with a biological mind or not, you can't get around these systems. They're there, they're omnipresent, they're historically bounded, they're changing, of course. And in, in, as a matter of fact, a lot of these customary systems are, a bit, are being transformed right now. So just to answer Mary's question, yes, the marine protected areas were based in indigenous knowledge, but we also ground truth. For example, we did a whole study in, in, in intercon interconnectivity, particularly with Labridae, with um, Kelainos undulatus, which is a Napoleon fish, and Bolmopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedopedoped
even if the government don't support the idea of having these uh, protected areas, we will also fail, right? So I think that this kind of uh, mixing local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and also some support from policies, like a, a strong governance on those areas, should be a very good, maybe a, a better compromise. So I'd like to ask uh, Shyam about this in India and, and how um, the government uh, supports or not the idea of having marine protected areas, um, I mean, based on, on fishers' knowledge. I don't know if this exists or if you can comment on that in India. I think um, marine protected areas are just coming up actually. Maybe you can talk about the Gulf of Mana or the Gulf of Kutch. These are the regions where we started talking about the MPAs. But um, uh, there are huge differences between the fishermen community as well as the policy planners in implementing such kind of MPAs actually. So uh, since these are areas where fishes are available in plenty, but even then the fishermen are allowed to fish in, in and around that particular areas. So the, the legislations are not high. So it's, it's going to come because for the, such a huge population, these may not be priorities in the future, but still it's on the way. I just want one quick note. In, in terms of what, what Mary said, I actually agree. I, you know, just because I said what I said, I doesn't mean I believe in full community-based management. Because as a matter of fact, a lot of community-based management has also failed. Okay? So we, have, we need to find hybrid kinds of systems in where local governance, government units provide some unit of coercion because if you leave it all up to local people to run it, unfortunately, most of the time they don't work either. So I, I actually agree very much with what you said. Yeah, I mean, the idea of giving back all jurisdiction to local communities was for a long time something that a lot of people you know, talked about, but I don't think that actually works entirely either. So we have to find new formulas to how to do this. Yes, especially when you need to uh, protect the area, the territories, you need some protection from other industries, for instance. You know, it looks like the policy has an important role uh, to play, especially, especially protecting the local communities from other industries and, and, and territories. Yeah? I... I Hi, uh, my name is Enato. I'm an also an under, oops, I'm also an undergraduate student from Oceanographic Institute, and I would like to ask my question in Portuguese. So, if you, if you can help me, Mary. Uh, na verdade, eu gostaria de saber como vocês atribuem as mudanças climáticas a uma possível redução na abundância de peixes, e caso isso seja possível, é, se existiria a possibilidade de responsabilização é, por essa redução da abundância, ou seja, será que futuramente existiria a possibilidade de você aplicar uma, um instrumento de, talvez, de controle da pesca por conta das mudanças climáticas? Você, vocês aponta, apontaram que as embarcações de maior porte são as que emitem maior quantidade de carbono, então eu queria saber se existe a possibilidade de responsabilização é, por meio de algum instrumento de gestão da pesca aplicado às mudanças climáticas. For all of us, yes. Uh, he wanted to know if um, we talk about climate change, and he wanted to know if climate change is impacting the fish biomass reduction. And if so, if, if climate change is affecting fish biomass, uh, how can it take, be taken in, uh, into account in the management system, like in the, um, how it can be, you know, have this responsibility that climate change is impacting them and how it can be uh, uh, applied like in, in management systems. Could you comment on that? Maybe in India you have this green because of the emissions, I don't know. I, I think there is a disconnect between the biologist and the climate change results actually. Now what we understand is we understand that the biomass is coming down. Now, you cannot have any, any programs wherein you could improve the stock, actually. But for that, what we do have is the management, management input and output controls, actually. Now, a very good example of what we have currently doing to ensure that the stock is not getting reduced is what is known as the minimum legal sizes. Minimum legal size. 
When you talk about minimum legal size, what happens is the fishermen has different types of craft and gear. They even catch small juvenile fishes. For example, the small juvenile fishes of sardine. Normally, a normal sardine counts comes to the tune of 40 counts per kilogram. 40 sardines will lead to one kilogram. So, but when it comes to juveniles, it could be as high as 120. 120 sardines leading to leading to one kilogram. So, if you are allowed this fish to particular fish to be stocked for a larger point of time, then probably that will lead to larger biomass and larger production. So, the current system of management which we have one is we have a close management period, close band season. During the ban period, you are not allowed to fish. It happens differentially for the different coast actually. For example, in the west coast, it happens during June till August. And the east coast, it happens during April to June. So during this particular period, you are not allowed to fish. So that's the me mechanisms by which we are trying to improve the stock. But even then, it's not going to happen because all the fishes doesn't breed uniformly throughout the period. Then we have something which is known the minimum legal size. What does the minimum legal size indicate? The minimum legal size for sardine is 10 centimeters and for mackerel it is 14 centimeters. So any fish which is landed in the, in, in the port, which is less than 10 centimeters, will be penalized by the government. So the government has arranged some local community management systems wherein they ensure that the boats could be impounded. So these are the mechanisms which we have. But again, when it comes to the administration, I told you there is a disconnect between the researchers as well as the policy planners, the administration. Because of death of staff and other things, most of the time we are unable to implement this at the highest level. But we have rules and laws, management measures in place, but they are poorly complied to or poorly implemented in the field. But we do have. Tu pregunta estaba relacionada al manejo de recursos naturales. ¿Español entiendes? Mejor que inglés. Eh, yo la parte biológica y ozonográfica a nivel de Solomón no, no tenemos datos que yo sepa. Se han hecho algunos estudios, pero no se sabe bien si la reducción eh, de biomasa, que no, que no está bien cuantificada, eh, está relacionada con cambio climático, que posiblemente lo esté. Pero te voy a dar un ejemplo rápido, solo para... Tú ya has, has asumido a priori de que hay una reducción, pero en, el, en, en, en las comunidades ecológicas, por ejemplo, de Madagascar, hay perdedores y hay ganadores. ¿vale? O sea, hay especies que, que, que se favorecen del cambio climático y una de ellas que hemos visto, por ejemplo, son los cefalopodos, eh, pulpos, eh, sepias y, y demás. Y en, y en el canal de Mozambique y de, de Madagascar, ¿aquí también? En el canal de Madagascar, mi, mi colega Warwick Sauer, que es un especialista global en, en cefalopodos, eh, supuestamente los estudios que están haciendo se están demostrando el incremento, y esto obviamente tiene un efecto económico también, y un efecto de manejo, porque tu pregunta era sobre manejo. Entonces el manejo es variable también, porque de repente pues para unas especies que se reducen o, 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 o tienen un, un shift, ¿no? que se van para el norte o se van para el sur, de repente tienes, eh, que, que tienes reducción por un lado, pero en otras no. Entonces el sistema de manejos tiene que ser dinámico y poder no solo entender la, la oceanografía y la ecología de lo que está sucediendo, pero también tener en cuenta cómo responden las, la gente costera a estos, re, estos retos creados por una, unas situaciones ecológicas, oceanográficas y económicas nuevas. Uh, yes, in, in some management systems, the climate change is taken into account in, in, for instance, in quota systems or in the estimates. You can put the environmental variables in the, in the stock assessment process and even in, in quotas, for instance, right? But uh, I want just to take the point that climate change is not really uh, just reducing biomass, but sometimes you have this shift in the range, like Shyam uh, showed in, from the sardine in India, that the sardines are coming from the west to the east, right? 
uh, yeah, yeah, or north, right? And the area that he's from are, are missing the sardines now, right? So it, it, it can also happen transboundary, you know? It can happen among nations. He's in the same nation, the, the sardine, but it can also happen uh, among nations, right? Some nations can, have, can become a loser because of this, changes and one nation can become also uh, a winner because oh, like the region that he mentioned that receives more sardines now even if they don't eat the sardine right so there there are uh, new treaties like international uh, uh, agreements that are starting to take this in consideration right also uh, so they kind of pay off yeah or compensation uh, uh, to the losers, right? Uh, and this is really uh, difficult because, of course, uh, nations um, like to have more resources as possible at the country level, so it becomes really important to have strong collaboration among scientists and among managers, right? So, for instance, in the, in the example that uh, Shiam uh, shows about the sardine, I think it's a very good example of the, the, the changing of, of the range, a distribution of one uh, resource, right? And, and maybe your, your question uh, relies to the issue of how India will try to fix this because the costs will increase for those communities to get the sardine now, correct? Uh, so uh, is there anything that we can do in resource management schemes to try to compensate or try to, you know, uh, reduce the cost of those people. So this is something that I, I believe that they would like to, uh, to think on, right? So this is an issue important to, for all of us to, to think and consider. Thank you for your question. Just to put another a couple of words also. See, what, what we are facing is, consequent to climate change, we, more than the biomass reduction, we face the shift. The shift could be the distributional shift as well as the range shift. Range shift. The distribution as well as the range. So because of that, in general, climate change is, is supposedly favoring the pelagic fisheries. Because the larval movements, the phytoplankton-based fishery, these are going to be better off. But what happened was, the production has increased compared to pre- and uh, post-climate change period. But what has happened is, it has gone to places where it is not being used. Now, the fishes has been put in non-fish uses. So there is a huge economic impetus which has come into climate change, which is going to be more important in the future. So there could be input control as well as output control. I was, I was telling that now, in, in, in India also we are planning that there should be an optimal fleet size. What should be the fleet size which could be permitted for a country? We cannot think of total TACs or ITQs because our, our country doesn't have such kind of system. But then we could have measures like the band season, the band, band seasons, we could have MLS, all these things are going to be considered to be better for the management. Very important. Thank you. One more question. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Caio Faro. I work for WWF Brazil as a conservation analyst at the marine program. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, I would like to hear from both of you about uh, self-proclaimed uh, self uh, data collection using apps, because uh, what I hear quite a lot here in Brazil is that we don't have enough data, um, f basically for all the, the, the analysis that we, we have to, to perform, but specifically about uh, fisheries data. Uh, and it's quite expensive to, to maintain people, as you were saying, uh, to pay the people to, to perform the data collection in, in situ. And uh, especially also when you, you, you stay like two months in a, in a, in a specific community or, or so. So I'd like to hear a little bit uh, if you ever use it, this, uh, this type of apps that like fishers can input their own catch data and also uh, what are your thoughts about the, the type of, of data that you get out of it? 
Yeah, as you rightly pointed out that the cost of data collection is going to be huge and the reliability of the data set is also going to be in question. Uh, considering the fact that what we have tried in, in, in India is, uh, for example, there could be two types of data collection systems. One in the US, you, you have the log books, where the fishermen go into the sea, they have a log book, they use a record, they're being paid for and it is being verified. But we don't use the kind of log systems in our country. Now, FAO has indicated that the data collection systems in India is quite good because of the fact that we used to have trained technical people working in our office. They are located for every 100 coastline, 100 kilometers of coastline, and then they're placed. And they go and do a stratified multi-stage random sampling mechanisms where you can use to collect the data. But then we found that that also had problems because it was in real time. It has to be, it was to be collected in, in sheets like this, the log sheets, and it comes, it takes 15 to 20 days for processing the data. So we understood that why can't we have tablets which, which will be having, which has got geography coordinates, real-time data comes, and now our data mechanisms is better. Now the cost of installation, having such data collection is going to be huge with the overheads, but once when it sets in, it's going to be easier. That's what one initiative which we did in the data collection, the marine fishery side. And in the marketing side, what we did recently was, we understood that the price range between the producers and the consumers are quite high. For example, it is 65% in India. When I tell 65% means, if the price of one kilogram of sardine is 100 rupees, which is paid by the consumer Maria, what actually the producer, the fisherman, Shankar gets only 65 rupees. So 35 rupees, 35%, goes in the process as marketing cost or marketing margins. Marketing cost could be the transport, nothing. So we wanted to have an Indian fish market grid where all the markets are connected and where we'll be having applications through which the data collection is being done. It has been successful, but it will take some more time to go. So for all those things which you're doing, currently we are into it considering the short, the cost of it but it will take some time to be more legitimate in the future. I, I think you know, it's, it's a good question and it has probably several dimensions to it. I mean, the, the first one, uh, I mean, for example, I, I walk around Sao Paulo or other parts of Brazil and everybody is obsessed with their mobile. So you have a very strong mobile culture. Everyone wants to have a mobile. So there's a cost issue. No? Are you going to use their, their mobile and you're just going to give them an app or something that, which is much more simpler? Or are you going to provide the actual mobiles? If you do that, then, then the costs really get really high and sample size usually is smaller because you're not going to give people a thousand iPhones or maybe you get a cheaper version. But, but I mean, and that's one thing, I mean, whether there's a availability or not of mobile technology and whether people know how to use it. You know, in Brazil, so my estimate here, might, it might be easier to execute in a place like this. But let, let me go back to places in Oceania. Even though people have mobile technology and it's increasingly and, and rapidly uh, diff, diffusing across all populations. Let me give you an example. Last year, we did a study on subjective well-being. So we actually gave people a phone. So we could phone them when they were fishing or harvesting to ask them how they felt. Because subje well, subjective well-being, okay? Subjective well-being is not just having someone in a questionnaire tell you how they feel. It's capturing it, them in the moment of the activity. So we did a whole research on subjective well-being, which includes Tanzania, Bangladesh, Solomon Islands, and incidentally, Sol Solomon Islands seems to be the happiest world in the world, the happiest country in the world. By our, our results, which are, we are preparing a paper for science in, in this, because it's actually quite interesting. But let me get to the particular thing. We gave the fishermen phones, right? And we gave them uh, not touch screen, but then the regular Nokia so we can call them, which is a different concept. They, they, do, they don't input the data directly, but they, they respond by voice. We had tremendous difficulty in having the fishermen keep the phones. They fall in the water, they get wet, they got this, they go, you know. So our success rate of respond was about 25 to 30% success. So basically, out of the hundreds of phones we gave, we lost, you know, if we gave 200 phones, 140 phones were wasted. 
So you, first of all, there's an issue of cost here now, because you have to buy 200 phones. Uh, and then the, the, the reliability of the data was okay, because the, the ones that responded in situ on the moment gave us what I would say an estimate of a proper response in their subjective well-being. So that was really worth the, the effort. So you have to do almost like a cost-benefit analysis and see whether what you're going to get is good or not, or you're going to be able to use or not, or whatever. Now, going back to your question about the apps, it can go the other way, because in Africa now, they're talking about, I was actually in a climate, I gave it a, a, a speech on, on a climate change thing, and about indigenous knowledge in Cape Town last year. And one of the big things that they were talking about is sending forecasting information on weather to local farmers through mobile technology. So, you know, so that has economic uh, implications of uh, expanding uh, mobile networks to all rural areas and so forth, and in some ways also diminishing local knowledge by saying basically, you know, we're going to tell you what the forecast is, and that's how you're going to, you know, you're going to behave uh, economically in terms of your harvesting, to, you know, your plans and so forth. Anyway, so um, maybe I'm off topic, but my answer, my answer is a mix of things. Uh, it could be that that you know, it is very useful to get accessible information for certain kinds of information and in certain contexts. For others, it might not be as reliable. That's probably the best answer I could give you based on the experience I've, I had in using that kind of technology. Now, we've used iPads to input data, but it is the, is the, it is the codifier, the person collecting the data that's using it, not the, not, not the actual subject. Uh, so anyway. Thank you. Yes, I think that here in Brazil there is a strong uh, push from NGOs to, to have this kind of more, um, uh, uh, let's see, digital uh, lo uh, logbooks or uh, catch and effort uh, self-declaration, let's say, right? Uh, well, what I think of that, it, it really depends on what kind of fisheries it can be applied. It's not for the whole uh, uh, amount of, of, of gears that you can use it. It can be really uh, non-reliable at all for some of them. I don't agree that it will really fit all <laughs> the fisheries. Uh, I think that for industrial fisheries, like onboard uh, logbooks, uh, real-time uh, stuff, it can be done. I think it's happening in some countries that you have this uh, declaration, but they also have, you know, something filming all the time so that the local authority can really follow if this is, you know, if the, um, the catch that, that is uh, put in the, in the APP really reflects what is in the film, right? Uh, so they can, they can, um, sort of control this, because it's industrial. So for industrial use, I think it can be uh, applied. For small-scale fisheries, there are some examples in the Caribbean that people are successful for some kind of fisheries, for small-scale fisheries. But as far as I know, the local reality here, I'm not sure that I will support as a solution like all fits one, you know, solution. I, my, it's my feeling that it can be just uh, non-reliable information as well. It's my feeling. And I, and I think there's also an ethical issue because, you know, we assume that mobile technologies are dominating the world hegemonically and everyone should have one. Well, you know, I actually, I'm, I'm looking for, I, I, I've been actually thinking of finding a PhD student to actually measure this because in Solomon's, we are still in that transition where people are getting mobile technology. And anecdotally speaking, you know, I would have an ethical issue giving mobiles out to people to do it. Because if it were, they were only inputting data for the objective of what you want, that would be fine to a certain extent. But, you know, if you give someone a phone, they're going to be listening to Looky Dooby and they're going to be playing games and they're going to do whatever, right? Now, it an and it can have an impact. Yeah. Now, like, and, what's the name of the student? 
Mariana, who always is con concerned about ethics, right? Well, you know, this would raise ethical issues, right? Because in a place like Vanuatu, Solomon, even Papua New Guinea, where, where mobile technology is increasingly increasing in the population, but it has not, we have anecdotal evidence, I can tell you. The, 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 you remember that multidimensional scale that I showed, the MDS plot that I showed? You see young people losing a lot of local knowledge, and I, if there's a driver in that, it's mobile technology. Which means that kids rather listen to music, play games, rather than actually go and listen to grandma or grandpa talk about farming or fishing or this. So, you know, you would talk about, you know, resilience, right, and vulnerability and all these kinds of issues. When you lose knowledge, you become more vulnerable because, you know, you have more homogeneous knowledge systems. And when you have a shock, your response is based on a very narrow body of knowledge. And I would say that mobile technology is contributing to the narrowing of that knowledge base. Thank you, very good comment. I, I think that uh, Shankar also shows the laws of traditional knowledge and he really uh, quantified this. So it's like real data. It's our feeling also that the traditional knowledge of fishermen communities here in Brazil is, is being, um, we have these laws. But in, in the case Shankar shows, he could quantify it and put some evidence on that. And I think that this digital revolution, it, it goes to the, to the debate on digital revolution effects and impacts in children, in cognition uh, capabilities, and also in traditionality and, and well-being of people, right? So I think it's something uh, that requires a more uh, um, comprehensive debate, maybe, <laughs> to, 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 to have this kind of answer, but it's a good question. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, hi, I'm Amanda, and um, I, at the moment I'm working with uh, in a project about um, fisher women, and uh, I saw some pictures in your present presentation, and uh, I would like to know um, how is the relation between women and um, fishery in India and Solomon Island, and if are they recognized? Um, what we understand that is fishing is mostly a male activity, that is the harvest operations. But we have quantified the kind of involvement of women in post harvest. We understand that the entire post harvest is being done by them, whether the post harvest and also the value, value addition, everything is done by them. And uh, when we had the tsunami in 2005, we never thought that women could be having a large role in, in the fishing activities. But the government has understood that women is going to be uh, the most important factor contributing to fisher, woman, fisher household li improvement, livelihood improvement. So the government has given new focus on women. So what they've done is they found, founded a new organization called Society for Assistance to Fisher Women wherein three or four fisherwomen could join a group, uh, something like a self-help group, and they're given around $2,500 per person. So they get around 10,000 US dollars, which is given as a grant. They could enter into small fishing, op fishing and farming operations and then can live. Unfortunately, uh, it was done in 2005. I, I was a part of a team. I led the team during an impact study of how this has happened. And some of the interesting results which just came out of that particular study is, now the women in those fishermen household, fisher households doesn't get money from men. That's a great achievement. And the second thing is, these are not seasonal activities, these are going to be year-long activities because they'll be either doing a garment, they'll be having a supermarket, they'll be owning a small tailoring shop, they'll be making small uh, caterings. And the second interesting thing is, now the men used to get credit from the women. And the third most interesting result is, most of them are in repaid. So it has, kind, it has definitely helped the women to improve the empowerments. And also we differentiate the empowerment into five levels actually. We did the political empowerment, the social empowerment, the psychological empowerment, the legal empowerment. And we found that the economic empowerment of the fisherwoman has improved much. But being a society where it's mostly male dominated in India, uh, it hasn't come out well, but definitely their livelihoods are much, much better 
than we used to have it earlier. And also some of the, some of the studies on the performance of the self-help group between male and female indicates that the women's self-help groups perform better than the male. And the government has also has taken a proactive step in giving the ration cards. You know, you have ration cards over here? The, the, the food stamps in the US? What is it being called in, in Brazil? Food stamps in the US? Okay. Uh, we have the food stamps in the US. That indicates that any family with an income below, below the poverty line are given food stamps so that they could get subsidized food from the government stores actually. Now, all the food stamps, which is also known as ration cards in India, are now in the name of women. So there is a huge governmental support to improve the livelihoods of women, but it will again still take time because the men are not that uh, less smart. So things are improving, but definitely the women's life is improving. You want to comment in Salomon? Uh, I, I think, you know, to answer your question, you asked about Solomon's, but, the, you know, just quickly a, a gradient, you know, in Africa or like in Tanzania where the fisheries are very strongly male dominated. I mean, women do have a role in, for example, they, they are part of the harvesting of uh, alg um, algas, uh, you know, they, they farm algas. And, um, but let me go just to make it short. In Solomon Islands, women are fully involved in the fishery, especially in the subsistence fishery. Uh, they, uh, they collect invertebrates in the mangroves and in the intertidal zones in the, in the reefs, and they are involved in coral, fisher, coral reef fisheries heavily. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, in the Western Solomon Islands, there's a, there's a Roviana word about women. They call them Hambu Malivi, which translates the fishing of the giant, because they claim that women tramp over all resources, because lots of women prefer to target juvenile fish, small fish. So the men have this joke, it's a joke. They say that the women are destroying all the reefs. So women have a tremendous role in the fishery. And there are, you know, we, when, we, when we've actually measured catch, you know, catch rates coming into a household, probably 50% of all the fish collected in a household comes from women activities or marine products, because counting invertebrates and fish, a lot of it comes from the activities of women, so they are extremely important, yeah. Yes, it's like marisqueiras uh, here in Brazil, right? We have these mollusks and invertebrates uh, collectors. They fish, they fish line fish too. Sometimes. But in, in Solomon Islands, the fish they line fish. all the time. good fishers. Well, we also have good fishers here in Brazil. Uh, but, well, I think, the, um, I think we have one question, or not? <laughs> yeah, we we have we have five minutes left. We have five minutes, please. Please pose your question. Do you have? Uh, you uh, use uh, the microphone? Yeah, so, yeah thank you. Yeah, I would just like to ask maybe a quick question. But, well, I'm Ligia. I'm Ligia. I'm a PhD in oceanography, and uh, my question is about MPAs, uh, marine protected areas. And I would like to, to return to what you both have said before. Uh, one thing uh, maybe to you is uh, if it's in, in India or in, in Africa, Oceania, uh, is taken in, uh, you're taking into consideration this uh, migration uh, you have uh, mentioned before. I mean, you're talking about sardines, but yeah, you, we, we know that codfish and, and any other species are also migrating northwards. And uh, you also have mentioned about MPAs. Uh, uh, you are talking about the flaws né, that, that you, you, you have been facing. And uh, if you'd like to talk just quickly about it and uh, if you think that it's a good conservation measure? Well, you know, there's a huge debate about the, effectivity, the effectiveness of marine protected areas and I'm not going to go into that debate, okay? Yeah. Now, there's a huge debate, a global debate, right? There's a global debate. But l l let me, I, I think that one, you know, sometimes people get too caught up in these things. The question is, what kind of management is it possible to implement? 
So let's say in Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, we're, we're talking about extensive territories of marine biodiversity, especially tropical marine biodiversity. What is it feasible to apply, right? So uh, a gear ban, for example, you know, targeting functional groups like scarids and stuff which, which seem to have a very strong f ecological functionality. That is an alternative, like banning night diving. So that actually probably even works better than an MBA in some situations. Uh, then you have, you have um, you know, size class restrictions, impossible. So, you know, certain kinds of things that we could use in a Western context where you have agents and you have police and you have, you know, a ministry involved that can actually monitor. In those cases, you know, size class restrictions, uh, back size restrictions, uh, gear restrictions, all those kinds of, uh, uh, you know, systems may actually work much better than a marine protected area. Now, in places like Solomon's or, or the Pacific, those things are impossible to enforce. And people don't want to follow. The only closest thing we've worked with to ban have been uh, uh, small mesh, small size mesh gill nets, okay? And night diving. And even that it's very difficult to stop. So one of the things with marine protected areas, because of the, sta the spatial component, it can be monitored by the community. So is it biologically perfect? No. Is it the most feasible way to do it? Yes. Why? You think about preventive management, right? You, you think about, you can't just leave everything to be harvested forever as population growth, commercial interests grow, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to become practical, pragmatic. Right? And so I'm, that's why I told you, I'm not going to go into the debate about MPAs. But for us, it's not an issue of whether the MPAs were good or not. It was probably the only feasible way of managing the fishery in the first place. Right? Now, there are other methods that we, we've actually started contemplating, like gear restrictions, particularly with the gill nets and night diving. And those actually seem to have, there's, you know, Josh Sinner and other people have written about this and said that actually that probably has a much stronger biological effect than some kinds of spatial temporal marine protected areas that are common in the Pacific. Because remember, a lot of the MPAs in the Pacific are not, are not fully no-take zones. They're MPAs that are sometimes open to harvesting for ritual performances and all that kind of stuff. And that diminishes the biological effectiveness of MPAs, yes. So this is a very difficult, you know, you have to balance all these different things and say, well, what is the only possible feasible system of management? Now, the, the Indian situation is probably extremely different because of the governance, law system, and so forth. Uh, but in places like in Oceania, where you have very strong local components still dominating uh, access and use of resources, then you have to work with what you have to work with, what's possible. Thank you. I should say that, you know, with these two brilliant uh, um, scientists here, we can really speak a week <laughs> on, on, on the subject that we like. So I, I will really keep discussing all of this. I, I, I had some questions for, for them that I couldn't even get there. I'm happy that we are... Uh, we have some time now. <laughs> uh, we've been together to, 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 to keep discussing, but at least I'm really happy that we could share something uh, on our work and on, on our discussion with you and with the people that are remotely following us uh, today. Uh, because of the time that we, we set, we need to really uh, wrap up our, our discussion now. Um, but, f uh, first of all, I'd like to thank very much uh, Dr. Shem Salim and Sh Shankar Aswani. It has been a pleasure um, to, to listen to their examples, and especially for us in, in Brazil, in, our, in the work that we've done in, in Gauss. It was very nice to, to improve uh, our world vision, you know, uh, coming from a central place like university and going to fishing communities and spending a lot of time in field work, learning from, 
from those communities a lot. Uh, and also, it was not related to what we learned here in Brazil, going at field, because it was really huge, very difficult to, to put in one just uh, publication or project uh, brochure, right? It is really four years or um, of knowledge in, in fishing communities that I, I need to acknowledge. And in this case of having you both here, it increased our world vision because we are not looking just at our local problems like in Brazilian problems, but we could travel uh, so, such a long distances from Oceania, Africa and India and to, to learn about different cultures, different fishing communities and different socioeconomic um, needs and also cultural uh, uh, aspects, very important for those communities. So I really like to thank the, the opportunity to join Gauss project, but especially to have you here at the Institute of Advanced Studies. That is really a place that we plan really to uh, come together for people from different disciplines like anthropologists, economies, um, natural scientists, and also humanities here to, dis to discuss trans uh, disciplinary um, issues and especially cutting edge um, issues that we need to deal for uh, the future of our planet and our, especially our civilization here, right, as humans. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your time here and please come to the next seminars. Thank you.